Thank you so much for being here this evening. My name is Ken Bradshaw, superintendent of the Richmond County School System. I hope everyone can hear me in the rear. Let me first welcome everyone to our third public hearing to discuss the Richmond County School System facility master plan. First, I would like to thank Principal Kennedy and his team for hosting the meeting as Principal Kennedy around. And Tut, if you're a member of the Tut team, thank you so much for hosting this meeting. Secondly, I'd like to recognize our school board members who are present. Please stand or wave your hand to be recognized. And finally, I would like to thank the Richmond County School System Central Office staff and the principals who are present. Please stand to be recognized. They might be sitting in the rear of the room. Let me begin by saying this is the time of year where we review our portfolio of schools to see if we are maximizing program offerings and being fiscally responsible. I believe we can do both. If we can do both, student achievement can be accelerated. Therefore, we have partnered with an experienced educational facilities planner to assist us with achieving this goal. While working with our planner, we have learned a lot over the past few months. The company is HPM, and our presenter is Mr. Tracy Richter. At the conclusion of this presentation, we hope you will be equipped with the same information that we use before making any recommendations. At this time, I'm going to allow our school board president, Mr. Charlie Walker, to make a few remarks. Are you okay? At the end. Okay. Well, at this point, I'm going to turn the program over to Mr. George Diaz from GSG. He'll make a few remarks about tonight's meeting and how it will be organized. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bradshaw. One thing that we want to just hit right off the top, just keep in mind, this is a draft. It's a draft document. It is not final. And what the board will be voting on is just what will be happening in the 24-25 school year. So the other things that you see in the presentation that go beyond that, they will just receive that as information, and the vote that they will make most imminently will be on the 24-25 school year. So we wanted to hit that right off the top. Let me read some legal ease here for us. Uh, prior to a local board of education's decision to consolidate an existing schools, where the consolidation results in students potentially being moved to another school or existing school, the Board of Education is required by law to hold public hearings and provide an opportunity for full discussion of the proposed plans. The plans are being presented tonight are proposals only and are in a draft form for the board to consider prior to any vote on the plan. The purpose of these public hearings is to provide the public an opportunity to learn more about the proposed projects, as well for the public to provide feedback, comments, and concerns regarding the proposals, so that the board members and the school officials can consider these concerns prior to any vote on the plan. You will notice that there is also a court reporter present who will be preparing a transcript of all of the comments and concerns so that the board members can review all of the information at the conclusion of the hearings and prior to any vote taken on the plans. The board members and school system personnel are here tonight to listen and receive feedback from the public. In order to receive as much feedback as possible within the allotted time, the board members or school system personnel will not be responding to comments during the meeting, but rather will be listening and receiving the points of discussion from the community. For any specific questions regarding logistics of the proposed plan, such as transportation routes and special education services, school system officials are here tonight and will be happy to meet with you after the conclusion of the meeting in order to receive those specific questions. So, 
one of the things that I want to make sure that we all keep in mind is tonight, when we start the Q&A questions, first we are going to prioritize any parents that are affected by this school. I'll make two, three calls to try to get as many parents the opportunity that are at this school to speak first. Second, we will then open up the floor for any parent from any school that has not already spoken at our previous meetings because we want to have a diverse dialogue and first hear from them. And then at that point, when the people that are directly affected at the school, the parents who have not had an opportunity to comment, then we will open the floor for any other comments. Just so you know, everyone here is serious about hearing everything. The last few meetings have gone over three hours. Nobody is going to rush here, but I will stress this tonight. We will have to keep the Q&A portion directed to the project. Anything that's personal, anything that's out of order that does not relate to this project particularly, we will be stepping in tonight because this is not to be bashing anybody or picking anybody, and we're not going to do that tonight. So I just wanted to hit that straight from the rip. With that being said, we're going to play a video. And then after that video is played, Tracy and HPM will go through his presentation. Once he goes through his presentation, we will open up the floor. This is the mic right here. We will have a stack of cards, and I will call you out first to see who from Tut would like to speak. With that being said, we can start the video. This is our home, Richmond County. We know its history and we're invested in our future. These are the faces of tomorrow. Our kids deserve a chance to learn and grow in a community that cares. Our teachers are terrific. Our leaders work hard. And most importantly, our kids are filled with potential. Shouldn't we give them the best? But to do that, we must change. In the Georgia Milestones Assessment, Richmond County Schools ranked among the bottom 10 of the 180 public school systems in Georgia. Our aging buildings aren't able to keep up. Our children are not getting the education they deserve. Change is tough, but new beginnings make way for a better tomorrow, and that is worth it. In the past, we fell short, but we can do better, and we will. We can give our kids state-of-the-art buildings. We can offer them more teachers, staff, and programs. And the state of Georgia will pay for it. But first, we need to adopt a 10-year vision that brings more money into the district using state funds we currently don't qualify for. Here's how it works. Georgia requires a minimum number of students in schools in order to get funding. Today, many of our schools do not meet the minimum enrollment required to maximize state funding. That means instead of all of these resources, they get just this. That's what we can offer the majority of kids in our district now. It's not enough. Our kids are missing out on the things that are proven to help them get ahead. If we keep the status quo, we're leaving free money on the table. We get less than other districts. Plus, we're forcing kids to learn in buildings that aren't up to par. But look at this. Here's what we can offer if we are willing to make changes. We have to consolidate. Right now, we have too many buildings and not enough students. Before the next school year, Here's what we need to do. Open New Richmond Hill Elementary to help families in an area where more kids are moving. Opening a new Bel Air Middle School will also balance out classrooms. Building a new Langford Middle School means moving students to Tut. This paves the way for faster construction. We need to close Spirit Creek Middle School. The same is true at A. Brian Mary Elementary School. The conditions in those buildings do not meet our students' needs. These recommendations came from the brightest minds in rebuilding school systems for tomorrow. 
HPM informed by a community task force. Together, we created a master plan. By evaluating existing facilities, tracing population trends, finding ways to get more state funding, preserving history while advancing technology and career opportunities. Now HPM is leading community conversations because we can't ensure the future of our children without your help. This isn't easy, but we're going to do things to decrease the impact on our kids. First, we're going to keep as many students together as possible. We're also keeping teachers and staff. Next, not only are we offering brand new buildings to many students, but this will allow others to get much needed upgrades. All throughout the process, we made sure buses will be there. And finally, we're preserving history. We're working with staff and alumni to make sure that's not lost as we work toward a better future. These changes are painful, but here are the facts. Studies tracked test scores, grades, and attendance. They all improve when kids move to fully funded schools with better facilities and more programs. Bigger schools don't mean bigger classes. In fact, it means more. More art, music, and the ability to learn languages and participate in sports. This isn't just happening in Richmond County. It's everywhere. Families are having fewer kids. Our schools were built for more kids than we have. Old buildings have high maintenance costs. According to the Government Accountability Office, 97% of U.S. schools need security updates. 87% are desperate for better technology. Aging buildings impact housing, too. Some neighborhoods which once served hundreds of kids will only have a handful. That's why 40% of our students don't stay in the neighborhood boundaries for high school. We need to adjust our school strategy to adapt to these changes. If not, our kids will only get left further behind. We can give our kids state-of-the-art buildings. We can offer them more teachers, staff, and programs. We can build a better foundation, offer world-class education, and ensure a better future. And the state of Georgia will help us pay for it. But first, we must change. Want to learn more about how this impacts your kids, your schools, and your neighborhood? Head to our website. There you can enter your address and see an interactive map showing the changes needed to ensure our kids keep up. This is just the first stepping stone to building a foundation for the future of a world-class education in Richmond County. Now we'll open up the meeting. First, we'll dive into the details about what this means for you. Then, we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Please prepare your questions and hand them to the moderator, who will give you further instructions. Okay, good evening, everybody. You know, I used to be a middle school teacher, and I used to tell my kids to get up front because it's loud to talk back there. So if you can't hear me, if, if, can you hear me in the back? Okay, because it's loud up here, and so I just want to be sure. If this starts to drop, just, Dr. Fry, raise your hand if this starts to drop on me, okay? So first of all, thank you for welcoming me to your community tonight. My name is Tracy Richter. Um, I'm an educational facilities planner that works with districts just like Richmond County to align facilities to future programs, to align finances and, and curriculum to make sure your buildings meet the needs of students. Um, as I said, I'm a former educator several years ago. It's been a little while since I've done that. I taught middle grades education for about seven years before I started doing this about 25 years ago. And, you know, what I found and what we're going to see tonight is a little bit of background about how we got to some decisions we made. Now, the idea is that there has to be a process to get in front of where we are. You know, that to state that this district is still in the bottom 10 in the entire state needs it means some improvement from some way, shape, or form. And one of the ways to improve delivery models and, and instruction is to make sure our facilities align to the right way, that our facilities keep up with education. Folks, the bottom line is that there's a lot of forces working against education, public education. 
and it continues to hit the public schools, whether it's coming out of Atlanta, Tallahassee, just go to any capital that I ever see, and they push the charter, they push the voucher, they push the whatever the public schools I can take away, I'm going to try to take away. You have legislators in this city that are trying to fight back on that, and I've met them. I met them on Saturday morning. They're fighting back to make sure that we get all the dollars we can. The problem is, is those dollars get stretched way too thin. And so part of this is trying to understand why that's happening and why we got to some decisions we got to. Now, I'll also tell you that, look, I don't think we can make everybody happy in a plan like this. And there's just no way to do that. Consensus kind of somewhat is a myth a little bit. I share all the time that I can't come to consensus at my own dinner table with two people or three people I share my life and my faith and everything with, and we can't decide what we're going to do this weekend. And so it's going to be hard to come together on some of these things, but I want you to understand how we got there. And maybe this presentation will help us get there a little more. And so I'm going to take you through some background data, and I'm going to take you through the actions for the, for the 24 and 25 school year. And I want to be very clear that, um, that the board is going to, we're going to ask the board to take action um, on, on, Mar on March 19th on just things that will impact next year. And this is one school that is on that list or two schools that are on that list. And then we do have a plan for further down the road. And that's important. When Dr. Bradshaw called me last summer, and he, he saw me at a presentation, and he said, he came up to me, he says, look, Tracy, we got to stop doing things the way we're doing things. We do this year by year, and it's almost we wake up in August, and we're at a position where we got to figure out which schools we got to close by the end of the year. Well, that's no way to do this. Facilities planning requires a long-term vision. It requires a vision not just in facilities. It requires a vision in demographics. It requires a vision on the students that you want in these schools. It requires a vision in programming and the types of programs you want, whether it be special education, whether it be career and technical education. And if there's no vision for that, the facilities don't matter. Now, I've heard a lot of feedback this week that says all this sounded like was about dollars and facilities. But I'm going to tell you, this is driven in program. The kids aren't getting the programs, and the teachers aren't getting the support and the resources to get the programs in there. The principals out there are stretching their dollars as thin as they can to get as much in the building as they can, and the dollars just aren't there. So it is a little bit about finance, but the finance is more about maximizing the dollars that you have in your building so you can maximize those programs so we can get and retain the best teachers in those buildings. And so facilities will matter. So understand this is rooted in programs, but a lot of this gets driven by, you know, what's been happening, you know, what's been happening over time. Make sure this is on. So let's start with demographics. And I think this is really important to start with this because I want people to understand that declining public school enrollment isn't necessarily a, a product of low performing schools or bad reputation of schools. There's a lot more that goes into it than that. One of the foundations of trying to get kindergartners to your school district is how many kids are born here. It just makes sense. How many kids get born or how many kids show up in kindergarten? And when there's less kids being born, less kids show up. I can't increase kids if they're not born. Now, not that this makes anybody feel any better, but this is everywhere. This is everywhere that we're working, and everywhere that I work, and everywhere I see. And I, what I'll tell you is that if I look back to 2014, and I look at the population of, of Richmond County, I see that the population's increased about 7,000 people. But look at this. We've increased 7,000 people, but we have 400 less births. So we're increasing our population and not having any babies. Now, that's 400. Now, if I look back, right now your biggest classes are your 11th and 12th grade classes. They were born in 2000, 2008, 2007, 2008. Look at that birth. Almost 3,400 babies being born here. That's 900 less than today. Or that's 900 more than today. And so I see this decrease and I see this increase in population and then I also am, we're faced with this housing thing where in the last five years, we have noticed that neighborhoods don't gentrify, aren't gentrifying again. They're not reproducing kids like they used to. And there's some reasoning behind that. And the example I've given all week, and those who have been in this meeting have heard it over and over, but the fact of the matter is, I'm 53, my daughter's now a sophomore, three years ago I had two kids in high school. 
I don't have two kids in high school anymore. I don't have any more kids going to the public school system. I have a house that's way too big for me and my wife, but it's almost paid off at 2.5% interest. Now my choice is I can go to something smaller for twice the price at 8% interest and cost twice as much. It ain't happening. I just told my superintendent last week, you're not getting any more kids out of my house, at least for the not next five years, because we'll move after that, if we can. And so you have all these things fighting against enrollment and fighting against enrollment that have nothing, nothing to do with the public school system. It has everything to do with what the public school system can't control. Now what worries me about this is I look at this and I say, what does that mean for the future enrollment out there? We already know that we've been in decline. And so if I look at the historical enrollment that, I might just have to press this harder. Matt, you might have to help me at some point. I can't seem to reach it, there we go. So if I look at the historical enrollment and I look at, again, if I wanna track how the school system's gonna look, Again, remember, the, the red and the numbers don't mean as much, and I'll tell you the numbers, but if you look at those dark reds, those are your largest populations. Those are your biggest classes that have gone through. And you can see the bubble, can't you? Those biggest, those big, real big classes in, in 10th and 11th grade and, and going into 12th grade. But look at my kindergarten enrollment. 10 years ago, we had 2,671 kindergartners. Today, we have 2,186. That's 500 less kindergartners than we had just 10 years ago. Now, if I push those kids through the school system for the next 12 years at 500 students a year and every kid stays, no kid leaves because you're not allowed to, that'll be 6,000 less kids in 10 or 12 short years. Now, folks, that's not doom and gloom. I mean, I'm kind of, it's just the way demographics work and it's the way populations work. It'll pop back up again someday. But the trends are is that People aren't having more babies. They're, great. They're waiting longer to have children. And then we're not, we're not selling our houses as quick as we were just even five years ago. And so until some of that changes, there's really nothing to show us any sort of positive trend up. And again, it's not you. It's, I mean, this is a lot of districts out there. And so we have to pay attention to this. And so as I look forward then, in this, and this is going to drive me just a little crazy. Sorry. So what we want to do, and I know this doesn't impact everybody in the room right now, but we also kind of looked at, and this is what I wanted to show, kind of a trend of high school enrollment. We look back about 25 years, a little more than 25 years, back to 1995, where there are about 9,700 high schoolers in the district. Today, there's about 8,500. Now, that's only, if I look at that, that's only about a 1,200 drop in that 25 years. Not too bad. The problem is, is because we see that huge drop of kindergarten enrollment and that bubble has already moved through the high school of high enrollment, it's only going to take about another five or six years to lose another thousand high school students. And it's just because that's how many kids we have in the district. And so when I, when I start to take a look at that, I, I really think about then um, how students, where they live and how they attend schools. And so one of, the, one of the pieces of analysis that we do, and again, a tough chart to read, everything's online for you to see this. One of the, tough, one of the things that we do is we try to look about where students live versus where they attend school. And this is a really important tool for us because we wanna see, first of all, how students move around in this district. Because students move around a lot in this district, actually. And so if I just kind of look, and, and I think, let's just kind of look at the schools that we're kind of paying attention to here. If I look at, um, let's go across on Langford right now. If I look across on the, on the chart, I see that there's 793 kids that currently live in the, in the Langford boundary. You see this number right here? That's 793. Of those 793, 246 of those kids leave the boundary to go find somewhere else to go to school. That is, at that point, that's 31% of kids. A third of the schools leave that boundary to go find another school. Of those 31%, 63 are going to other boundary schools, and then the rest are going probably to a, they're actually heading into a magnet probably, or a choice program. Now this happens across the district, and you can see the transfer rates across up to 34%, 27%. At the high school, we have a high school that transfers 40% of their kids out of their boundary. Now, I hear words like tradition and legacy. And then I see 40% of kids leave a boundary, and I think, 
Kids aren't chasing legacy. They're chasing programs. They're chasing an opportunity. They're chasing the programs and curriculum that they need. And so there is a balance of that. Sure, tradition and legacy make a difference. But if tradition and legacy don't give you the programs and the opportunities for success, they'll go find them. And right now, that's what happens here. And so how do, we, how do we slow that down? How do we keep kids in their neighborhood schools? How do we make sure that the magnet schools are always gonna be important, the choice schools are always gonna be important in this district? But how do we make those neighborhood opportunities or the schools in your backyard just as important? And right now we can't do it because we're just stretched way too thin in order to do this. And so again, when I look at the demographics of this and I go, and again, you don't think it's about students, it's about students. We're trying to see where they're going. We're trying to see what they're trying to, when they're, what they're seeking out. And how do we get there? I'm gonna just have Matt help me on this. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so if I look at the projected enrollment then, and this is the last thing on demographic, and you can see again, as I look down at that projected enrollment, the first thing I notice is that big blue um, kind of in the middle. That's a, kind of that COVID trend. And again, you have to pay attention to that, but that doesn't drive your decision making. It's a couple years, and we know that, that we have to alter that. But if we go across and we look at this, we see especially at the 6-8, the 6-8 enrollment is pretty stable because we have, we're going to continue to hold on to that, that 12,700 kids at elementary school. But when we start to feel the impacts of 400 less kids that were born just last year, that's when you start to see the drop. And then you can see at the 912, you can see it's going to drop from 84, almost 8,500 in the next five or six years to about that 7,500 mark. That's all the kids we have. I can't go invent new kids. I can't find new kids. We are going to, there's going to be some development. There's going to be some new business that come in. But go back to that first slide. You're already growing and we're still shrinking in births and still shrinking in enrollment. So look, I hope it comes. But the, the good thing about having a five or 10 year plan is that you can make pivots to that. You can adjust to it. If you do it year by year, you can't pivot, you can't adjust, you have to react. And you just can't react when it comes to facilities and millions of dollars decisions and when kids' lives are at hand. So you have to have that plan in front of you. Matt, go ahead. So if I look at the funding then, and I think the funding is really about, you know, how do we get to maximize dollars in school? I will tell you first and foremost that closing and consolidating schools isn't about cost savings. It never has been. It's about how you maximize the dollars you already have. Because you don't save dollars, you're going to still spend them somewhere else. And so how do you use the dollars that you have most? And most importantly, how do you use state and federal dollars to the maximum that takes the burden off of you more as a local taxpayer? And that's kind of the point of this. And so, look, folks, it's not money driven until it's money driven. And when the funding is not there or when we have to stretch our funding so thin across the, across the board that we can't get all the programs in, then we have a problem. So we use this triangle as an example all the time. And this is what all school districts deal with, that you have an opportunity to offer the most diverse and robust programs that you can have at an operating cost that you want and a school size that you want. Now, if I walk through this triangle, the trick is that you can't have all three because you can't. If you want diverse and robust programs at small school sizes, it's going to cost you more money. If I want small school sizes at low operating costs, I can't have those robust programs that we need. And if I want those robust programs at low operating costs, I have to get my schools to an enrollment to get full funding. The trick here is this. And this is what makes you unique. This is what makes you not Atlanta Public Schools, not Savannah Chapel, not Columbia County. This is what makes you you. Is it what does your triangle want to look like? Right now, your triangle looks like you want that, that you want high, these small school sizes at high operating costs. And folks, it's and no programs. So that's not a triangle anybody wants. And so facilities can only help shape that a little more. How do I get this shaped the right way so you have the right amount of programs in the right amount of buildings at the right size for what you can afford and how you maximize those dollars? And so as you work through a plan, it's how you shape that. Now, in the state of Georgia, this is your minimum funding and your full funding allowance right here. 
And so at the high school level, there's at 970 um, is your minimum funding. And I'm going to show you what minimum funding means in a minute. And folks, spoiler alert, it ain't a whole lot. When you get to 1680, you get to more fully funded schools. But folks, you're not going to have 1,700 student stations in high schools in Richmond County. It's just not something a size that this county is comfortable with. Let the Gwinnett counties and Cobb counties build those 2,500 schools all day long. We're just not going to do it here. We don't feel like that. this is a community that embraces that size. But we sure would like to get our high schools more to that 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 across the board to try to get the maximum. At the middle school level, what we talk about a lot is 640 is the minimum. I'm going to show you what that means, and it ain't a lot, or a full funded program at 750. That's not much more. And so we're going to show you how we're trying to achieve those goals. Now, if you look at the minimum funding, 16 of 28 elementary schools can't even get minimum funding because they don't have the enrollment in the schools. Six of eight middle schools right now can't even reach minimum funding. And four of the eight high schools. And so let me tell you the trick to this, and this is how districts work the money, is that those schools that can get full funded, that can have all the programs because they have enough students in the door, they have enough teachers to teach, what starts to happen in order for the district to try to achieve equity across the district for programs is they start taking money from the fully funded schools and they pull them into the less funded schools in order to make sure that everybody has about the same program. So in essence, they're robbing Peter to pay Paul. So what the trick is is that let's cut down the fence enough so everybody can see over it. The problem with that is that defeats the purpose of the fence. If I can't get every school to full funding, it defeats the purpose of education. So is it a student and a program issue? It is. It definitely is when I, when I see this. Go ahead, Matt. So if I look at the high schools or I look at the elementary, look at the minimum funding at 450. So with that, you get a principal, a guidance, a media specialist, and then you get an art teacher, and then you're going to pay for the music teacher, the half principal, and the PE teacher, and the half nurse. You're going to pay for that locally. Okay? Because that's the state funding formula. Now, it doesn't get a whole lot better, but I'll tell you, when, when, you, get to the, when you get under 450, this is what happens, is things start to disappear then. You don't get, all, you don't get anything. That's a problem. And so what happens is that you can't maximize the state dollars. We would like actually to get the elementary schools. If we could get every elementary school to even four teachers per grade level, that doesn't sound very big, four teachers per grade level, that would mean every elementary school would have a minimum of 550 or 600 kids in their building. That gets more people in the building off of your back, off of your taxpayer back. If I go to the middle school where this impacts you, at the minimum right now, that is that 640 number, I get a principal, a one, a one assistant principal, I get a nurse guidance, art band, two PE teachers, I don't get a world language and I get a media specialist. And look, I get almost nothing when it comes to CTE. Now, as a middle school teacher, I can tell you what I most enjoyed about middle school is that middle school is supposed to be about ex exploration. It's about getting kids to explore and wonder what's going to happen and see what's out there for them. We can't get there. We can't get there unless we continue to burden the local tax dollar if we can't get and we can't maximize the dollars in there. If we even get to that 750 number, look, I get more. It's just really that simple. And so this means teachers get bigger teams that they can work with. We can work with, we can work with certified and non-certified teachers to move non-certified teachers into that cert, um, certificated program. And we want to get there, but we have to make sure that our enrollments are meeting those needs to get fully funded. And so I would actually like to see more CT in those middle school classes to get them exposure to what might, could, what might could happen in the high schools. And then if I get to the high school, this is scary. Four of the eight high schools can't even reach the minimum funding level. And look, two assistant principals, only two guidance counselors. I get one less PE teacher, which means less coaches, by the way. I can't get the world languages. I can't get the choir that I need. And then I'm limited on CTE. I just don't think, I just don't think that Richmond, high, uh, Richmond County kids deserve that. 
I think they deserve these programs and I think they want these programs and I think we could give these programs to them if we just take some time to realign and draw a mission around how our facilities can align to that. Now, again, I will let you in on something. Facilities can't do everything. So I don't want anybody out here saying you think facilities can fix it all. No, they can't. Because we can give you the best facilities and we can align these facilities if we make some good choices here. But I can't hire the principal, I can't hire the teachers, I can't hire the coaches, I can't do any of that. I can give them good facilities to teach in and good environments to teach in, the tools for a facility to do that. That's as far as I can take it. It takes, it takes everybody working together to make sure this can happen. Go ahead, Matt. So our recommendations for the 24-25 school year. Okay, so if I look across the board, I see that I've got Richmond Hill um, taking that K-8 school that's there. They've built a new elementary at the Richmond Hill area, and they're going to make that K-8 the middle school and open up the elementary school. When you, see the term, when you see the letters NPU, those are planning units, neighborhood planning units that we call them. Neighborhood planning units actually help us plan a district. They can build the district neighborhood by neighborhood in order to create better boundaries for us. And so as we look at those, um, those planning units, and, you, and I'm going to show you a tool that, so, that you can see your planning unit, um, that we're going to move some planning units in order to balance those enrollments out there. Okay, to make sure that we're getting full funding where we can get full funding. Now, where this starts to affect the, the Tut and Langford communities is when I start to talk about the Bel Air Middle School. Okay, in the Bel Air Middle School, um, what's going to happen is that, the, of course, the Bel Air boundary, elementary boundary is going to go into that building, but also we're going to look at um, Copeland and Reynolds are going to be full feeders. So that impacts you guys. Okay, because we're going to move a complete elementary out of this feeder pattern to go to Bel Air. And the reason we're going to do that is to open up space and to have enough room when we move the two schools together and we combine the two schools together that we're going to have the appropriate enrollment where the middle school is not a thousand kids, where we have it at the full funding and keep it at a reasonable enrollment. Try to get around that 700 and 750 number for the middle school. And so in order to do that, though, we have to change around some of the elementary feeder patterns. Now, that happens in the Bel Air move, and that's going to happen this year. So in the 24-25 school year, that Copeland elementary boundary, the middle school kids that live in the Copeland boundary, are all going to go to Bel Air. Okay? So that impacts what the Langford kind of feeder pattern would be. Does that make sense? Everybody kind of knows that geography. Okay? And then... The, the idea was, and there's a reason behind this, and this is, I think, part of what, what people are probably wondering about a lot, is that we talked a long time about, do we wait to combine the schools until the new school gets built? And we did talk a lot about this because the, the problem that we have with that is that if we have to do that, we have to stage the new construction of Lang, of, of that, on that Langford site. Okay, I'm not even gonna call it Langford. It's, it's on the Langford site. Okay, we'll talk about name, we'll talk about all that later, but so on the Langford side, if we have to do that, we have to do it in stages, which means it's going to take an extra whole year to build that middle school. Taking another year costs millions of dollars to do. And so what we thought about was what if we went ahead and made the, made the transition for the, what would be the rising 7th and 8th graders and then the new sixth grade coming in, what would happen if we just combined them for next year and then we can take a whole year off of construction and in two years open the new middle school? Now that was our thinking behind it, okay? And so I know that there's probably people wondering, would it even fit? Well, keep in mind that we've already moved an elementary feeder completely out in order to already reduce the population. And so, and we've looked at kind of those feeder patterns and neighborhoods that are coming in and how do we make that work? And so if I look at, um, and then, then we've got some closures that have to, that, we are, uh, that we're looking at also in closing Spirit Creek and closing Mary. We went out and had those community meetings the last couple nights. We heard a lot of good input on this. Um, we've heard a lot of good input on some of the stuff that's gonna happen beyond that that I'm gonna talk in a minute about. But you can see how this is going to work. And so I want to take you just very quickly is that, and again, all of these maps are online so you can see them. And I'll show you where to find them and everything like that so you have access to them. But you can see how now the, in the new Bel Air, you can see how it pushes a little further east over there and it absorbs kind of that, you see this Copeland boundary over here, you see Copeland up on the, on the top right here, and then pushes all that over into the Bel Air. 
Okay, so that boundary looks completely different, which will mean that the Tut Langford boundary will look different as a middle school because of those elementaries that actually make it up. And so with that then, we do have, an, and we know that the capacity in here, and, and the one thing that we do is we always look at the live-in enrollment. Okay, how many kids actually live here? Now I want to take you back to that other sheet. Remember how many students we see transfer out and how many kids actually stay in these schools. We've looked at the analysis of the rising grades that are gonna be in there, and we actually anticipate of that number that we think that this building's probably gonna be, if we, can, if we do combine it next year, we actually think the enrollment here is gonna be closer to 670 or 690. Based on, based on magnet school enrollment, based on some transferred out where students are currently going, based on some of the elementary feeders that are going out, those students that transfer into other feeder patterns also. So this number, although it might look concerning, we're not, I don't think we're concerned with that number, okay, because of this. Now, a couple other things about replacing the building for the future. Now, replacing the building on the Langford site had a lot of logistics to it, obviously. You guys know this site very well. It's really hard to put a comprehensive middle school on this site. It's pretty tight. Got a big old slope down there. It's a beautiful piece of property. If you want to look out on a creek, right? I mean, it is. But it's not really big enough to really hold what we want to offer. You know, full athletic fields, practice fields, those kind of things. And the move over to the Langford site means, because there used to, remember, there used to be an old elementary on that one, that's cleared out. There's a lot more acreage there. The property is going to be a beautiful piece of property that has all those amenities that middle schools need. And so that decision actually to go to that site was made before I walked in the door. But as you look at it, that now we're in design, it's already in design. We want to start to get people involved now in how it's going to look and do all that stuff. And that's, that's down the road of conversation we're going to have. Um, and be able to start that first phase of construction this year, believe it or not, if we can make this happen. And so two years down the road, state-of-the-art middle school for the students that stay in the Tut and Langford boundary. Something I, that I hear has been promised in this community for nearly 20 or 25 years. A new middle school investment into this. That's about, give or take, a 60 or $65 million investment into these students, just on a facility side. Now, with that, with that consolidation of those two populations, I know there's questions around staffing. The intent isn't to break up staff. The intent is to take whole staffs and move them together and work with and HR to work with all personnel to make sure that they're getting the assignment and moving together as much as they want to. That's the biggest, one of the biggest priorities, making sure those teachers are consistent with their students. You know, middle school is a short time to spend with kids, but we get attached pretty quickly. I'm looking at teachers here. We get attached pretty quickly to those kiddos. But we want to make sure we keep those staffs intact. The other thing is, is that the IB program will be offered to all students. That move, the IB program will be more flourishing. We want to continue to improve that. Um, increased number of, of exploratory offerings, six and a half of those. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to coming together for the students from a programmatic standpoint. And again, I get closer, I will likely be close to that 700 number, which gets us really close to a fully funded middle school, which means we get the staff, we get the support for the staff, we get all those exploratories, which I just said, six and a half exploratories, that's a great offering for the kids. And the full IB program too and the access to the full IB for all students. So there's a lot of programmatic benefits to combining also. Look, I know that's a tough move, and then just to move back in a couple years, but I think in the long run, what's gonna happen is that technically, the students that are gonna see the moves are gonna be, this student, these students will make one move, and then by the time the school is built, you'll have a new sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Literally, you'll have a new sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. They'll only move once and they'll move over to the new Tut Langford facility over there. And so we tried to minimize the student movement also. And so it was a thought that how do we make sure that we do the least disruption as we can while we're doing a full construction project. And folks, that isn't always easy. And so the new boundary kind of looks like this. It's a, it, it looks different, certainly. Um, and, I, and we know that we have, we're gonna have the space to do that here. And so, um, so that is the plan for this, for this area right here. Go ahead. Now, and then again, this, the, and these are things you can look at. I'm not going to cover very tight on tonight because we've covered them in other meetings, but closing Spirit Creek and then closing Mary, and then with the new Richmond Hill, 
obviously we got some NPUs that got to move, and then the Richmond Hill Middle School. Again, Steph, if you want to go online and look at it, you can. Now, there's a longer term vision that has a huge impact on this district um, that I think we need to pay attention to because it has an impact on students who make choice, it has um, students who have a, an impact on the high schools they're going to attend in time. And so the first thing we want to talk about is how, that we, how we have to get there. Next year we have a, a couple of more um, schools that we have to look at for consolidation on the elementary grade level. Now, we've held Gracewood off a little bit because of we're still monitoring enrollment. We have declining enrollment in the southeast part of the district. Um, there's a lot of schools down that area, and it's still very rural, too. And so we're trying to figure out that we know we can reduce one elementary and get kids actually closer to schools. And by closing one, we can get three elementaries up to full funding. And so I know that's a tough move for that community, but it benefits a greater whole. Now, also in Jenkins White, um, we anticipate with the closure of subsidized housing in that area that the boundary is likely only going to have 100 or 150 kids next year. And by, by, white, by the, the city closing down some of those housing areas, it's had a big impact on enrollment. Nothing the school district did. It's a city decision to go to more and, 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 and talk about how do we improve living conditions for, for citizens there. Now, the bigger moves that happen talk about the high schools at, at mostly Josie and mostly at Glen Hills. And the first one is, is a domino effect that and when you take some time to read through it and you take some time and I'll explain it to some extent. But I met with the Josie community today. I met with the Josie Alumni Association at lunch today. And I had, I don't know, we had 60 or 70 people in the room at lunch and it was a real productive discussion. But the idea here is that um, is that we want to try to look at how we get middle school feeders closer to high schools and how we improve those, those, those high school campuses. And so one of the first moves that we want to make is to move the A.R. Johnson program out to the RCTCM building. Now, again, I want to be very clear because this got out there and it got cleared up last night and it got cleared up really nicely last night, is that we're not discontinuing any magnet program in this district. The magnets stay. The choice schools stay. What we're trying to do is we're trying to actually encourage um, program and, and continuous program improvement there, be able to grow the programs if they want to grow. But in order to do that, so to move the Air Johnson, but we're also paying attention to the neighborhood feeder patterns. Now, by, by using Murphy and Hornsby and combining those two middle schools, again, we can get to that 700 enrollment at a fully funded school building. And so, but we would have to use the Air Johnson building. Now think about that. That has a relationship to Laney High School. And there's a good relation, and if you could build a relationship between the elementary and the, or the middle school and the high school, shared resources, you know, those kind of things, we'd like to see that combination happen so we can strengthen that Laney feeder pattern. Now, also then, then we would do some selective demo, then we would be able to move the Josie kids into the Murphy Middle School building, and then we would do some selective demolition to the Josie High School and build a brand new state-of-the-art, comprehensive, with, with, it'll com combine with the Murphy existing space and the Marion Barnes space, but it would be a brand new state-of-the-art choice high school at Josie that has full-blown career tech pathways in a brand new state-of-the-art facility to the tune of, we were looking at some estimated things out there, to a tune of almost $30 million of reinvestment into a full-blown career choice opportunity at a comprehensive high school. And so there's some work to do with the RCTCM program and how the programs from there that could move over to grow in that would work. And there's some curriculum things to work through with A.R. Johnson and how that's going to look. If, and right now the plan is to leave it at that RCTCM campus, but there's still a lot of discussions that we're having with the Johnson community. I'm going to go out and speak to them in a couple weeks too. But we've got some time to do this. We've got time to develop this thought process and how we get there, but now we have a roadmap. And so what will happen is that the feeder patterns for, uh, for Josie will go away. They'll actually feed back into the, um, they'll feed into the Laney, into the Butler feeder patterns. But the Josie boundary will always exist and the school the students that live in that Josie boundary will always have first access into that school because it's a neighborhood comprehensive district-wide choice career focused building so you can get a high school diploma and you can have career pathways both and the neighborhood will never the neighborhood boundary will never ever disappear they just won't have feeder patterns we'll track students the other way about getting them through programs 
Now, also in this, because of the move at the Hornsby and, and Murphy, the thought is, is that we wanted to make sure that we develop a full middle school campus, just like we want to do with the, with the Tut Langford. And there's some limitations on the site with the C.T. Walker building that's at the end. And so the, the thought was is that we can, if we demolish that building, we move the C.T. Walker, which again, the C.T. Walker's program always will exist. But we move it to the Tubman building with significant investment in that building on playgrounds, on circulation, on queuing, on classroom and technology. The building's a really good building. Um, we could move that and then demolish that building so we can have a full middle school campus. Therefore, the Murphy Hornsby Middle School at ARJ wouldn't intrude onto the Laney High School fields and they're sharing fields and pushing practices back late at night. And so we want to make sure that every middle school has a full middle school experience both inside and outside the building. Now, we get down a couple of middle schools all of a sudden and we get them to fully funded, that six of eight middle schools automatically drops where we're starting to get these middle schools fully funded for the programs that they need. Some of the harder discussions to have, and look, you can see this is a four or five year plan out there. And this is a lot of discussion to have in the Glen Hills community, but the Glen Hills community can look forward to this idea that we want to reinvest, really reinvest in elementary and middle grades education there to start. Eventually what would happen is that what we would do is we would replace, um, we would replace first and foremost Barton Chapel Elementary brand new elementary school for the area. And then the plan is we would close Meadowbrook and we would move them down to the Jamestown Road site, but Jamestown Road would actually go into the Morgan Road building, which is a middle school building, some renovation of that building. What excites me about an elementary school that moves into a middle school is middle schools have full competition gyms, they have theaters, they have science labs, stuff that elementary kids don't typically get and they'll have access to. That's a really positive move. but. We only want to put enough money in there to hold it until we can get to our next BLOSS program to eventually put a brand new Jamestown Road elementary on the south side of that Glen Hills feeder pattern. But the other plan then is that we would move the Glen Hills Middle School to the high school campus and we'd move the Glen Hills Elementary onto the middle school campus, which would then, in a five-year plan, discontinue a Glen Hills High School. And that takes us down. I know, folks, I know that's a tough one. And that's a hard discussion to have. And it's going to be a hard discussion in the Glen Hills community. But right now, there are 12,150 high school seats in this district. Our projected enrollment is 7,500. That's 4,500 empty high school seats. Right now, 4,500, that's four of your high schools. That's how many seats are empty. That's how many empty seats you pay for. We can't keep all the high school seats and expect our programs to get our maximum. And so, these are hard discussions to have, but we have time to discuss and how do we, how do we make this work, okay? And then finally, I think um, with that, that just gives some explanation of it and goes through some of these things too. So yeah, we won't cover this because I just covered all those. Again, this presentation's online, you can see it. We're gonna have another meeting tomorrow night. We're having a meeting on Monday night. We're gonna cover the same stuff here and then we've got a meeting at Central Office at 3 p.m. And people wonder why 3 p.m., I can't make 3 p.m. Well, we've been offering at 6 p.m. every night. We'd like for more people who might not be able to make a night meeting, maybe work second shift or third shift, to be able to come in and talk too. And so we're trying to offer some different times and variety in that. On March 19th, we will ask the board again to look at the 24-25 plan to make approval on recommendations for that. So with that, I'm going to... Um, we're going to go to question and answer. Now, here's the thing. is that This is why this looks a little different for those of you who haven't been watching these meetings. Is that we're going to, um, Board President Walker's going to get up. I know, I know. And so he's going to get up. But when you get up to ask a question, if you have a question that I can answer, I'm going to answer it for you. It takes a little longer sometimes. But I'm, folks, I've seen this done for a really long time. And quite frankly, I'm tired of people just having to walk up to a microphone and feel like it just falls at the end of the microphone. You demand a response to your question. I believe you demand a response to your question if you're looking for a response to your question. I'm going to do my best to do that. If that extends our meeting a little bit, that's fine. Um, but what I want to make sure is that we have full understanding together and we have a conversation about this. I want to hear your concerns. I want to hear your questions um, because those are important. So I can take those back to the board and say these are the concerns your community has based on these recommendations. They are going to be recorded. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to the board president Walker really quick, and then we're going to, George is going to tell you how to go through the question and answer period. Thank you, Tracy. 
Um, I'm your intermission entertainment as you get your questions prepared. Uh, actually, I asked for a presidential moment of uh, just reflection. Um, I'm going to give you just a quick reading, so bear with me. Uh, since the origin of Georgia's act to establish a system of public instru instruction in 1870, it was a usual practice to name schools after educational figures. Over time, that, cra that practice has gone by the wayside somewhat, and it's pretty evident, as you can see, about new schools that are being built aren't really named after people. They're named after either a place or a location or a street. Um, a little bit of a history lesson also. Uh, this school right now, John Tutt Middle School, was named for Mr. John M. Tutt, a math professor at the Haynes Normal Institute who established himself as a successful coach both at Haynes and Lucy C. Laney High School in the 50s. He was also on the faculty of Boggs Academy, an all-black all -black private school in Burke County. Now, if you don't know what the Haynes Normal Institute was, it was established by an influential, the influential educator, Lucy Craft Laney. The Haynes Normal Institution, Industrial Institute was chartered in 1886 and grew to include a kindergarten to junior college curriculum, the Lamar School of Nursing, and a teacher training program. Named for benefactor Francis Haynes, the Institute also served the African American community as a cultural center before its replacement in 1949 with the present Laney High School. And I'm going to read just a quick list here of the schools that we have in Richmond County that are actually named after real people. The high schools that we have are A.R. Johnson, C.T. Walker, John S. Davidson, T.W. Josie, and Lucy C. Laney. The middle schools that we have are Langford, Murphy, Tubman, Tut, and what used to be with Sego. The elementary schools are Copeland, Collins, Craig Houghton, T. Harry Garrett, Dorothy Haynes, W.S. Hornsby, Joseph R. Lamar, Jenkins White, A. Brian Mary, John Millage, Sue Reynolds, Roy Wallins, and Willis Foreman. These people were politicians, businessmen, farmers, ex-educators, uh, former superintendents, and they were all very important uh, in the community and, and actually ended up having a name, a school named after them. The reason I say this is because 47 years ago, I went to Tut Junior High, 47 years ago. I was in the original part of the, the building uh, and our legal counsel, uh, Mr. Mr. Larry over here also attended Tut. So I know what it means to be associated with this school and I have been on the board for seven years, and this is the first opportunity that I have seen that takes rich, the opportunity to take Richmond County out of that bottom 10. This is the first real concrete opportunity, aside from all the great work that the staff does, all the great work that the teachers do in the classrooms. This is something that we are going to be able to afford to give our kids all of the programs and all of the things that are necessary for them to succeed. And I would think that if Mr. Tut was sitting in this audience tonight, he would agree with that. And I would think that any of those other folks whose the schools in this county are named after are sitting in that audience tonight would also agree with that. So I'm not up here to preach to you. I'm just letting you know, 47 years ago, I was part of this school. I cooked breakfast down in the home ec room. I went out on the football field and sweated and yelled, go Dragons. We got on buses and went out to Seago and played. We, I spent a lot of great time here. But for me to think that because this is going to go away is going to diminish me somehow, and my position on the board shows me that by the fact that we are able to provide what the kids who are in school today, the ones that are doing the learning, that, that need the education, those are the ones that we need to think about. Myself as an alumni here, if it's a sacrifice to say that, you know, the, the legacy, I, I want to tell you all this too. It is not the intention of this board, any of the folks on the board, to do away with any of the legacies. And I think that was part of Tracy's presentation. We will remember and we will make sure it is part of anything that we do, move, go, that we do going forward. And I just wanted to take, like I said, a moment of privilege here as being an, an ex-tut person myself to say that I am very impressed with what we're hearing and I hope it makes sense to y'all. And again, if Mr. Tut was here, I think it would make sense to him too. Thanks. 
Okay, so we're going to start the Q&A question. Uh, this gentleman's going to lead us off. He uh, has a question regarding TUT. If there, are there any other questions right now regarding TUT with the cards that have been passed out? Are there any, is there, okay, is there anybody who, who, if you don't have a card and you want one, raise your hand, we'll get it to you, and sir, you can start with your question. Test one, two, test, test, test. Can you uh, bring up the uh, audience mic? Oh, and uh, you can take off the clock. Dr. Bradshaw said no clock. You can take off the time clock. Dr. Bradshaw said no time clock. And if you can turn up the mic for the folks asking the questions, and sir, you can start. My name is, my name is, Donald, is it, yeah. my name is Donald Davis, and I entered this building in 1959 as a seven-year-old, and today I turned 72, and I'm celebrating my birthday here. With, okay. And that points out how important this is to me for me to spend my birthday here. I'm also on the board of directors for the John M. Tut Alumni Association. And with my board, we have talked about the, this proposal. And we're re realistic about what is taking place. We understand the limitations as far as the site is concerned. You know, it's landlocked, you've got three roads here, and the topography does not lend itself to going down the hill. But our concern is going forward, we do want to maintain the legacy of John M. Tut name. I had the opportunity to meet Mr. Tut as an elementary student when I was here. Uh, and I've done some research uh, on the building itself. I know that the original school building with 10 classrooms only cost $252,000. The walls were made out of plywood, so it was important that they put termite prevention down in the ground. Uh, so our concern as an alumni association and other members that have attended Tut here, that that name be maintained. I was glad to hear Board Member Walker address that uh, just a moment ago. So. Once again, having come here in 59, spent 11 of my 12 years in this building, the, uh, graduated, for some of you that may not be aware, Tut was a high school. We had two graduating classes, the class of 69 and my graduating class of 1970. So once again, our plea as the new school is constructed that it fulfills our request that our legacy through name recognition of John M. Tut be a uh, part of that. Thank you. And um, for just can you give him your name for the record? Donald Davis. And I think Mr. Davis deserves a happy birthday song. The dead day. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Mr. Davis. Happy birthday to you. Thanks for spending it here with us, Mr. Davis. We appreciate okay. that. So, um, and look, and I, I asked Mr. Davis to speak first because I want that, I want it to be on the record how much you want legacy and tradition move forward. And I think in the design of the new building, pull as much from here as you can, preserve legacy through good construction that recognizes the legacy and name. And that's why I wanted, and I think it's a great thing. The board does have a process of naming schools that you'll go through. Be a part of that process, please. Be a part of that process, let the board know. Um, this board wants to hear that input and really look forward to bringing forward that legacy. Thank you again, Mr. Davis. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Hey, I am Effie Culling. And Hi, Effie. I am that triangle. I am an employee. I'm a coach. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your presentation. Very good speaker. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I was on the SPLAS committee representing the one cent sales tax for from the beginning till last year, till I got removed. <laughs> and then, uh, I am a parent, all four of my kids went here and one did go to magnet school and I can tell y'all parents, Abri Mary Tut and Westside is an excellent program. All four of my graduated from higher learning with honors from college. So it can happen. I got a construction management nurse, an electrician who teaches at Augusta Tech and one that's raising her babies but she took x-rays. So 
I have all fields, all four went to Tut, and it was an excellent program. It still is an excellent program. My coworkers are the other family members that when your kids come to school, they know they are loved and cared at when they come to our school. A little nervous too. Um, I'm also a taxpayer. I live less than a mile down the road. And I can tell you when my husband and I, and thank God you took that three minutes off. Sorry. <laughs> um, my husband and I, when we bought our house, when we moved to Augusta 32 years ago, we did it to live in Tut Zone, Abraham, Mary, and Tut. That is where we wanted and we felt safe for our children, for their education, and for their safety to be in a school. And I'm sorry, Abraham, Mary got taken over, but and closed, but I can tell you that was also an excellent program. Um, I am, what it is is what it is. I know there's nothing I can do to change anything, but as a taxpayer, I wanted to, for my children to be in school. That's why I work here. That's why I come here all the time. I've been here for 18 nonstop years, and my oldest son is 39, and he went all the way through. So this is a great program, and Mine did go to a magnet school, and I can tell you, I still got, they still got it from Tut and Abraham, Mary and Westside. They got quality education in a traditional public school. My one concern is, yes, it is for us employees, also for our kids, but I really would have appreciated y'all to have let us, the employees, know what was going on instead of my neighbors and our parents telling us the day it went public because I kind of feel like we got pushed to the back along with our kids because you can send out notes about severe weather closing, you can put it on Facebook, but you couldn't tell your students or your employees who come to work to do face. I still have parents asking me questions and I don't know what to tell them. I think you should have owed us the respect to have let us know so we can tell our parents what's going on. And I can say, as I said already, I work here and all four of my kids went to Richmond County public traditional schools, except for the one that went to Magnet for two years because she's too much like me and I couldn't handle her in the school with me. And she went to A.R. Johnson when I had to drive her both ways. They didn't have a bus for her back then. And she's only 27. And I see you nurse at Wellstar. So that's it. I'm just sad thank that Mitchell. it's gone to that because our kids will miss. Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> oh, and I will share this. Uh, any other questions regarding Tut or Langford? If you have a card, you can make your way up here. If you don't have a card and you want one, we'll give you one up here if you have a question between Tut or Langford. Go ahead, ma'am. Hi, my name is Denise Atkins. I'm a Langford Middle School parent. Hi, Denise. Hi. Both of my daughters are at Langford okay. on House Bill 251. Okay. okay? Yep. We are actually in the Hornsby zone. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I'm sorry, I addressed this question with the, the uh, Mr. Haddon at the Board of Education. Okay. He, however, was learning about all of this from me. So I immediately called that day and he was like, I don't even know about this, you're telling me. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have the answer. So under House Bill 251, it's slightly different than a zone exemption. Zone exemptions have to be done every single year. Yep. House Bill 251, once you're approved for that school, you're good through the highest grade of that school. So right. my, my one daughter, she's in eighth grade, so this doesn't apply to her, but the other one is sixth grade at Lankford. Okay. So she's good through eighth, you know, to complete eighth grade through Lankford. So I'm assuming that she would, because she's technically a Lankford student under House Bill 251, that she would move with Langford students to Tut. Absolutely. Okay, I just wanted to make yeah. sure. <laughs> That's, that is a, you know what, that is a great question. There's a thousand different kind of instances out there for parents. Right. And questions like that, look, as far as communication goes, and I will tell you that we've met with teacher advisory board, we met with uh, every, we met with the principals group, we met, we have a community task force, we have this online. There's a lot of stuff. I apologize that you guys found out like you did. And, but I do know that we're doing, I mean, we're making a lot of efforts. It's been, this has been out for a while. I had a meeting in December for the community to come out. We advertised it, we got it out, I had 50 people show up. I know, I know, we want people to be there. We will do our best. 
short of knocking on your door, I promise. But to your question, absolutely. Okay. They follow that school and you're good. Okay, that's just what I needed to know. I Thank was afraid because at this point, like magnet school testing's over with. If if we were gonna have to go back to our school zone, we yep. kind of were gonna yep. be Man, screwed. Uh, hold on, so. yeah. So good. We're and good. and I and if you helped. 50 other people tonight by asking that question. I appreciate it. Yeah, because it. this part of it was never addressed because yeah. we don't live in yep. in any of the zones for Langford or Tech. Yeah, your so. 251 goes with you. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for that. Good evening. Hi there. I'm a proud Tut alumni, 44, 45 years. It's been a long time, been about 45 years. I graduated class. Uh, 79 and one of the things that I want to say Tut is a wonderful school mm -hmm. the history of Tut and a lot of successful people have come from Tut I'm the CEO of a digital network channel that have customers all around the world it's a global it's called TV now and one of the things that I learned from being at Tut the principals the teachers everything around it I don't want us to lose sight uh, right now, maybe our projections are low as far as enrollment and people, but that can all change in a nickel of a dime. We have people that are going to want to start moving back down south. And when you start having people moving back down south, you're going to see these neighborhoods start increasing. And the problem I don't want to do is pull the trigger a little too soon. Oh. Okay, we got these projections. So okay, fine. But what happens when it starts overrunning? and we closing some of these schools down and then all of a sudden we overcrowded. So one of the things we gotta start looking at trends, I know trends happen to be, okay, our numbers are down, but I also see that people gonna wanna start moving back down south and families gonna wanna start moving down south from up north. So I want to take in that consideration, especially the school right here that has a history of success and have a history of people doing very well at Tut, and if you look at the success story at Tut, you will see a very a large amount of successful people came from the public school system. Agreed. So we have to start pushing that fact that look at success stories of the public schools, especially at a Johnny and Tut. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. How you doing? Good. How are you? My name is Brian Baldowski, for the record. I am a um, Richmond County alum. I went to Gracewood, Sego, then to A.R. Johnson. I have two daughters that go to C.T. Walker, and I am currently a teacher here at Tut Middle School. And so I appreciate, I think you've, I've watched the first two meetings, so a lot of my questions were answered, and I think you've done a great job explaining everything. And um, I understand that, you know, it's, kind of our own fault, we just didn't have enough babies. I mean, my dad had six, I only had three, so I understand the direction it's going, and I think it's a good plan. Um, my question, or my statement is, and I appreciate Mr. Walker um, uh, touching on the history of Tut, and Mr. Davis as well, and we also have uh, Dr. Walker back here, and Dr. Walker, did you just publish the book on John M. Tut? He said March 15th? Awesome. Okay, so my concern also is with the history and legacy of our schools, uh, just like Mr. Walker said earlier. Um, and just to tell you a short story why I have my suspicions is, uh, of course, I went to Sego Middle School and uh, we had a staff member come over from Richmond Hill K through 8. And I was talking to her, I said, well, whatever happened to all that Sego stuff? I said, what happened to our championship trophies and our, all that stuff? I said, well, is there like a um, you know, trophy case or something that preserved any of that? Um, and she was like, nope, nothing, there's, there's nothing. Uh, and so that's why I have my, that's, that's part of my concern is that, that we would like to, like Mr. Davis and Mr. Walker said, we would like to have, and the gentleman that just spoke as well, is that we would like to have something, some kind of assurance that, you know, some people did some things here, yeah, and a lot of important things. People became, you know, uh, great contributors to society from these institutions, and so we would like that legacy to uh, to continue. Um, I mean, I know we'll, you know, these changes are necessary, and we'll, you know, gladly welcome our friends from Lankard, 
Uh, we'll get them some nice uh, Tut merch, and it'll all be copacetic. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, uh, that, that's, that's part of my concern as well, is that we would preserve that history uh, because we have a lot of, the, a lot of that here, and, and so that's, that's basically my concern. So, and, and, and I would have that, and, and look, that's a legitimate concern. What I would like to see happen kind of moving forward as we, as we do these kind of projects. And we had a conversation with uh, the facilities group yesterday who put together those lost. One thing I'd really like to see happen is I'd like to see kind of the school community, the alumni group, get involved during design. Now the school's in design right now and the basic layout's there. But I think that involving the community in that process with the design professional, with those guys, and even for me to help along too, is to be involved in that design. Then and you're not, I mean, we're going to have the space types we have, we're going to have all that. But how do you pull stuff out of this building that makes a difference into that design? How do you pull just the loose stuff, the trophies, the banners, the things that you can incorporate in? Is there a mural wall that has to be preserved? Is there something, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in history preservation that's really important, even in brand new buildings. And so um, I grew up in rural America. We used to take the old block of the school name and put it in the new school building in the front when we would tear down schools. And that happens in the Midwest all the time. And so I think there are ways to bring it forward and to make sure they're in there. So uh, I would encourage this process to do that. And so I hope that can happen. We'll continue to contact the Alumni Association through this. We've promised conversations. We've got two years this building opens. This conversation happens for the next two years. And if I'm still here working and Dr. And Dr. Bradshaw wants me to, I want to make sure that we're accountable to that. And so I'll make sure in this process, I'll stay accountable to it for you guys. All right, I thank you so you much that. for everything. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a parent and a volunteer and a potential substitute for the area. So I know there's a lot of vacancies when it comes down to teachers on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. um, when we combine the schools, uh, Langford and Tut, uh, all the other schools that you're going to combine, what would happen to the classroom size and then the teachers? How would it help with the, the ratio? Because right now they're having issues currently, even though that the, it's depreciated in kindergarten, but in middle school they still have 35 students and one teacher, and it's really hard to control the classroom. Yeah. So are they going to combine together? Yeah. The teachers, are they going to combine together? Yeah. I mean, first of all, the whole staffs come together and okay. work to do that. That will happen. And this is a good question. I should put this in my presentation more to make sure we're, we're clear. That here's, a, here's the thing about class size, and I understand that that happens, and sometimes a lot of times class size is due to how many teachers you have come in and how many teachers you can afford to come in the building right. and stretching those resources. But here's what happens, and I, and I will tell you, and people can disagree with me, but this is not a disagreeable moment because there is no relationship between a school size and a class size. There just isn't. There are schools that have 2,500 kids in them that keep 20 kids in their classroom if they have the right amount of classrooms and they have the right amount of teachers. The small schools, what I've found in 25 years of doing this, oftentimes it's the smaller schools that can't get fully funded that have the class size issues because they can't get enough staff and teachers and resource teachers to minimize class size. And so when we combine population, one of the things that we figure in our capacity number is a maximum class size, that we don't want to overcrowd the building, we don't want to overcrowd classrooms. Now, what's overcrowded? Uh, what's, what's that? What's overcrowded? What's overcrowded? Yeah. I mean, we have enough room that we've built some capacity in these buildings that even 100% there are still classrooms open. And the reason we do that is that we want to make sure in a capacity that there are open classrooms for like research, pull out for speech, pull out for those kind of therapy and one-on-one -on -one instruction. So we know that we have some extra space built in our capacity number anyway. Okay, and so we don't want to, we don't want to overutilize a school. The new building actually is going to be built for 1,000 students. So we know there's plenty of space in the new building. And we know that we'll have enough space. Those transfer rates in the magnet schools, we, those kids aren't moving out of those buildings. We know that they're going to maintain that. So the class sizes will maintain class size. Now here's the, and I'm going to tell you this. People ask me, can you guarantee that? And I can't. And the reason I can't guarantee that is because schedules work really weird. That when students go to band or when they go to choir, or they go to exploratories, at the middle school and high school, what happens is that Everybody has to take English. Everybody has to take math. Everybody has to take social studies. And so 
you get some times where those classes, especially at high school, a ninth grade class can have 35 kids in it because they have to take English and they don't have enough English teachers to teach ninth grade English. But the next period, in the classroom right next door, AP Calculus has 12 in it. And so it's hard to manage period by period all the time. And so what, we, what, what will happen though is that if you can get buildings to be in fully funded, which means full staffing, that helps to stabilize class size so we don't see those bigger fluctuations. And it takes a minute to get there because of the, they have to adjust into the new enrollment. But that's the goal, is to make sure that is minimized when we can. Well, something to consider yeah, okay. um, in that situation, yes. if, when you have the 35 um, student classroom, the mm -hmm. 12 student classroom, is the paraprofessionals that we Absolutely. hire through like whatever, you know, maybe just have them on board so they can come in when mm -hmm. the 35 students come in because it gets really, really complicated when you have one teacher trying to teach 35 students and there's a whole bunch of action. Like they tell them to sit down, do this, do this. Completely and agree. 15 minutes for the classroom lecture and 45 minutes of them telling them to sit down. Of management. Yeah, yeah. it's yep. hard. I completely agree. And yeah. again, when we talk about full staffing, we talk about paras, we talk about coaches, we talk about, I mean, I mean, I mean academic coaches. That helps that. Yeah. And so, completely with you. Yeah. Keep, and keep coming to a microphone and saying that. Because I, I think I believe that. Another thing, um, what about the PTO and the PTA? Um, how are they gonna combine from the different schools? Are they gonna just like, conform into one? You'll, you'll be one school, yeah, but so. But the PTO and the PTA are associations that are attached to the schools. Mm -hmm. so well. How would that work? So it's going to be one school, okay? When, when the new building gets built, it's one school anyway. And so yeah. there'll be one PTO, PTA, whatever, and whatever the term is here for that. There'll be one organization for that. And so I think that the two organizations work together to figure out how that all works from an organizational standpoint. Alumni groups will have to come together a little bit, I think. I think that'd be a great collaboration. So I think you just have to work together to manage that. Gotcha. Um, I and, know that. and the district is committed, like, where there's, a, there's a, an initiative for PTA and PTO. So they'll be committed to helping. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so Those much. Those are great questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and ma'am, what was your name for the record? Can you just state it for the uh, court reporter, please? Uh, Shalante Wright is my name. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I am a parent and my children have attended Tut and I have one coming Tut this year. I'm very excited for the upcoming school year for Tut to hear the changes is okay, a little disheartening. I want to state the question that she just asked you. Okay. She asked you what is the capacity number once they're combined. You didn't ever give her a number. So I was waiting for a number. Okay, so if I go back to that chart. Okay. okay, so we, we calculate the capacity just to be about 705. We anticipate with the current enrollment that is, and this includes that elementary feeder, this includes that elementary feeder and the current kids that are leaving for magnet programs into other boundary schools that probably won't come back because they're in their schools already. We anticipate the enrollment to be somewhere between 670 and 690 for next year in a 700 capacity building. Now, once again, when we figure capacity, we figure extra space because we know we should have resource spaces and buildings. And so to utilize every classroom unit to do that, we'll have the space for that many students. We know we will. And that's here at Tut. At here at Tut, here, right? yeah, for the two years, yeah. On the hill where it's not much. So you don't have like porta potties in the back? But I don't want porta potties in the back. Well, we put it out. No, the no, portables, the yeah, portables. No, 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 not the portables, yeah. Okay. No, we're, I don't even know where we put a portable on this site, to be honest with you. Okay. And so, yeah, the, the goal is we know that, I mean, we follow those enrollment trends very closely. And we're, and again, I don't want it to sound weird, but we're tracking that student, every student by that to make sure that we get the numbers right in there. Okay, and I think, but what I think it tells us mm -hmm. is that, you know, to Mr. Davis's point even, is that this site is so, I mean, this is a great, look, it's been a great facility and it's served its community so well for so many years. Mm -hmm. But to move forward on a state-of-the-art middle school, this isn't a site that is conducive to getting the student enrollment <sighs> we want. And I think that's the new building idea, is that to never have that issue again. Okay. Yeah. So we're going back to the community, okay. right? Okay, yep. So we're talking about um, elementary, and mm -hmm. you talk about middle school and high school uh, the present, during the presentation of yes. yes. And this is just a draft, because mm -hmm. they're going to sit down and talk about it at a later date, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So we have, have we gave it any thought to the mixing of the games 
and these communities that we're mixing in together. Because, see, we have schools that don't get along. Yeah, I know. And I am an employee and I work yeah. legal and yeah. I'm currently working in housing. Yep. And the current issue we have now is they don't get along. Mm -hmm. And they're bringing it back to the neighborhoods. Yep. And it's taking over the school and the school time yep. Yep. all day long. So yep. you're mixing two schools together mm -hmm. that really don't get along because it's a gang issue. Okay. Then you're mixing, hold on. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought you were, I'm sorry. I didn't and then you're mixing know. them around yep. in the high school area. So you're putting Laney and then you're putting Hornsby, one rival school with Murphy, they don't get along. And you're putting them across from Laney, that's really the bottom, but you're taking them from Jennings and Glendale area and you're putting them over there, that's gonna be issue. Okay. And that's gonna be, the teachers can't touch them now with the fight because my son was in one and the teacher just sat there and watched him get beat. And so now I'm looking, thinking about you're mixing all the schools and putting them together across from these gang, gangs that we don't have right great, like Richmond County right now with the sheriff and everything, they don't have enough deputies right now. Okay. So they can't get to the 911. The 911 calls are, are routed to Atlanta, they're routed to South Carolina, and it, you don't get anybody right now. So we're not getting that help on that end. And that's not gonna help us when we're trying to move them closer to the area. I want them to sit down and think about that. Sit down and get someone and look at that, because that's going to be a hard decision to make. Two, because the teachers are going to have a hard time with that. And it's hard to pick it up right away. You're going to have to increase their pay. You're going to have to increase those teacher pays and to buy the school. Because now, now, the teachers are going to have to deal with 35 to 40 students, and you're talking about one or two teachers. That's a lot of mixing of emotions and parents and all that. You're going to have to increase their pay. Richmond County, you know, Georgia overall, they're gonna have to do it in Richmond County alone. Yeah. So if we're trying to talk about making that, that needs to be a part of that draft plan. We gotta put that in there, increase, because I didn't see it at all. Okay. Increase in teacher pay, we gotta increase in pay. Because they're dealing with a lot, and I can trust them all the time with my babies while I'm at work doing my job, yeah. okay? And if we're combining them, we're gonna, need to, we're gonna need to make that merge happen, okay? Okay, okay. thank you for that. <laughs> You don't have an answer for that one yet. That's all. I, okay. I, I actually, if you okay. want me to answer yeah. something, I can. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, if you look at some of those feeder patterns at the elementary grade level and some of the mm -hmm. neighborhoods that do get split up with that, there, there is some resolve in that. Okay. And we've, we've paid close attention to that. Okay. And, I, and we do. We've talked about, okay, what does it mean from a security standpoint, from staffing and security and how we do that and how we support teachers. Mm -hmm. Teacher pay, everybody agrees with you. And I think that Dr. Dr. Bradshaw made a, um, was so. speaking the other day and he said, mm -hmm. he said his number one goal is to increase teacher pay. I hope so. And so I know, I know the state is looking to give that bump up and he wants to do more because to attract the teachers here. So, but there's something that, that, I, that you have, and it's hard to, when you're talking about these societal issues that come into our schools and mm -hmm. you're dealing with it every day, we know it. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing is that the rivalry exists from a school level and then a neighborhood level. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a bad rivalry that comes from a bad place. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at the new boundaries, first of all, mm -hmm. there's some resolve to that to make sure that that is minimized to some extent, okay, to some extent. You're not gonna solve it all. But here's the thing, and I know that we have to, as these kids grow together, that may resolve, and, there, and you're right, there's gonna be a little pain in there. Mm -hmm. But here's, and look, at the risk of walking out, who knows what, is that it's hard to deal with the societal issues that walk in the buildings, but what I'm not going to do is I'm not gonna have a gang determine how our schools are run. Not gonna happen. And so I know that's hard to say, and I know that might be dangerous walking out. But the fact of the matter is, is we've got to try to work to make sure that we grow our kids together, that, that we can minimize that as best we can. And, I'm, and so we have talked about this. We are looking at those feeder patterns. We're looking at the neighborhoods that change the schools so we make sure that we're minimizing that as best we can. Okay, and we know it still exists. And so there is, We've talked about how do you get the security? How do you get those systems in there to support the teachers that you're minimizing that to the best possible? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm with you on teacher pay, but there's no way teacher pays with the current way these buildings are run. You can't do it. 
And so this community is embracing a brand new school that combines two, and that's a great thing in the future. And that really does help to that goal of increasing teacher pay. So it doesn't go into bricks and mortar. It goes into the teachers and the programs and the kids. That's the goal of this. And so I hope he can deliver on his promise, but I will tell you, if we can't make some of these goals in this overall plan, that promise will never be met. It just won't. And so, and that's the fact. There's only so many dollars at so many level. And so keep coming to the mic on it. Keep coming to the mic and fighting for that because I'll help you as best I can. Trust me, we're having a hard time with that right now, but you don't see it because it's not really um, newsworthy. Yeah, yeah. And it's not, it's hard to cover that, yeah. but yeah. That's a, it's a real issue here. Uh -huh. And I see it every day. Yeah. I've been seeing it for the past three years. That's the issue. Okay. And it does affect the schools. Yeah. But I want the board to really sit down okay. and I want them to really look at it. Maybe okay. they need to visit some of these sites, okay. the areas. Y'all take time and go in and visit them. Go, go visit these areas and then y'all will get a bigger picture yep. because trust me, it's a problem. Okay. Okay? All right. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Sure to appreciate it. Okay, my name is Christy Cole. I've been at Tut Middle School. This is my 31st year as a teacher. Okay, so let me just start this by saying that I'm a dragon through and through. And when I first heard the news on Channel 6 or whatever it was that I was watching, I was disheartened. Because not only am I a teacher that's been here for 31 years, I was also a student and it was a junior high when I was here as well. But with all that being out there now, I'll tell you that when I went and I listened to the presentation that was done at Mary, and I have gone online and I've looked at everything. And it's like I told um, Dr. Bradshaw yesterday when I talked with him, that on paper, this looks great. Tut, I love it. But the, the building is not conducive for, for what we need. It's just not. And so to come together and make one school great, like Tut and Langford are, that needs to be our goal. Are there gonna be a lot of um, <laughs> hurdles? Absolutely. But we need to embrace it. We need to make sure that all who are in charge know what our grievances and our concerns are. And then we need to hold them to it. Say, you gotta let us know, how are you going to keep, keep the gangs from coming together and, and creating all kind of craziness? We know we're here every single day. There's already been some talk about it. The way TUD is spread out, it's not an easy school to, um, to manage. Um, we need a lot more eyes here. We need more security here when that takes place. Now, once everything levels off and, you know, all those hormones and those raging, you know, the gangs and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, we get it together and kind of mail it out, then we'll be able to face some of the other things that we need to deal with. So I think just we need to come together, look forward, because I'm telling you, I was ready to, I was ready to turn in my papers and say I'm done. Um, but once I heard the presentation, um, I was pleased. I was concerned and upset because you know this is Tut, this is my baby. Um, so just keep that in mind, and we're going to be here. I mean, Tut is a family. I mean, truly. And we, we want to welcome Tut uh, Langford over here with us. And then when we go to the new school, that we're all one. We want that same camaraderie um, as one school, not two separate schools. And so I think that's what we all need to look at. Instead of this is Langford, this is Tut, we're going to be one together. And yes, I do hope that they continue the um, John M. Tut legacy name because it does mean something to our community. Um, off of that subject, um, one of the ladies asked me, said, what is the, going to be the um, capacity for the new building? So the capacity for the new building is built to 1,000, okay? okay? And so the hope is, honestly, the hope is, is to 
as, as part of the IB growth in the district, we want to make sure that more students get exposure to IB programs right. and can actually grow those other exploratory programs too. And so initiatives to push CT further down into middle schools to attract more kids, but to build it to 1,000, we know it'll take a minute to maybe get to 1,000, but right. that's fine. But that's better than Keep, not having enough room. That's exactly right. You'll have plenty of room in the new building, um, a full middle school site, fields and all the stuff that you want to, um, to deliver a full middle grades education. Okay. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm Dr. Cole, Dr. Christy Cole from Thank Tut. All right, we have a couple questions that have been submitted, um, and they wanted us to read them out. Uh, this is Ms. Tasha Boone. When, are the, when the schools emerge, how will it affect the naming of the schools? Na affect the name? The, the, name, the naming oh. of the schools. Oh, yeah. the name of the schools. Okay, um, so the board, uh, the board has a naming process for when this happens and when new buildings get built. Again, the good part is this district has a, a history of keeping names. And so um, I think that one of the things that we need to keep working on is this community to come together to push the name forward. I don't want to lose this legacy at all either. And so I think a work in the process um, that there is pretty evident that that Tut name wants to stay around. I think Langford probably means a little bit too. But try to keep that as best you can. But work in the process with the board to let your voice be known how much this means to you. And they're going to listen, and that's a process to go through. Um, and we'll make sure that you know when that process happens. Okay? I suggest that as soon as, well, I would suggest that as soon as the board makes a recommendation about what moves forward, is that you try to enter that as soon as possible just to make sure it's something you don't have to worry about and that you just know what you're doing moving forward. And you're going to need a name on the building while it's being built, so you're going to have to name it sooner than later anyway. Uh, second follow-up question that she had. With the merger of multiple schools, how will the principal and the assistant principal be selected for the newly merged school? Okay, so there is something that uh, when, I, when I tell you that I can't answer something, that's one I can't answer. I don't hire, I don't fire, I don't do any of the staff or anything like that. But look right back there, the human resources tab right there. Um, they can explain how all that works when an administrative thing. So, <laughs> look at those yeah. smiling faces over there. <laughs> so. You know, in meeting facilitation, they call that a punt. Um, so that just got punted to the back of the room. So they can help you on that, and I promise they'll help you on that. And just to reiterate, once the, the Q&A portion of the meeting is over, as you see, there are uh, names at, at each table, so you can go over there and ask them those specific questions. And I also wanted to bring attention, just to reiterate, to make sure nobody in this room misses it, okay? March 19th. That is when the board will vote. March 19th is when they will vote only on the proposed plan for 24-25. The things that go later on down the road will not be voted on that night, will only be received as information. March 12th is the last public hearing. So just want to make sure everybody hears that and you can also Get all this information from the social media accounts that the school system has. If you go to Next Era EDU, these meetings in its entirety from the very first one are posted on there along with this one. So you can have them for your record. If you can't attend the meetings the rest of, the, the rest of this week, they will also be live streamed on the district website. Uh, second question from Ms. Lisa Lattimore. What is the projected timeline to update Tut for the merge? Will there be enough time for teachers to prepare their classrooms for the first day of school? Um, so Lisa, I, I want to ask, uh, does that mean for to come over here? Okay, that's what you mean for the, in the summertime, okay. So um, the good, I mean, one of the reasons we're on this timeline for this year is that we had to get the, long, the, the bigger plan done. So as soon as the board votes on this, you can, you're going to establish some timelines for these things again. I'm going to defer a little bit to human resources and to um, probably teaching and learning also. I would imagine that you probably try to stay on the same schedule. And I know there's moving. I think that, I think there's probably questions on, I've been in my classroom a while. There's stuff in the back of the closet I don't know that's there that I need to move, but get in boxes. How do I move my stuff? So move management is a big part of this. Okay. And so the district is going to help you manage how you move. 
And so this is a, this is a real HR question, but once that approval gets made, then the action steps get in place to come to you individually as schools and work with your staff on how that works and the timeline about when you can get in your classrooms. The, the right answer is, yeah, you should be ready to move in when you're ready on your normal schedule, like when you start a school year. But we want to make sure that, and the district will very be, be very clear on the communication of that transfer over, including how you move your stuff, okay? Move management's a big deal and it gets complicated, so we want to make sure we're very organized in it. Lisa, thanks for that question. Uh, next question from Joe Kimball. Um, looks like the first question is, is it possible to rebuild Hornsby Middle School on its current site for Murphy and Hornsby? It is, um, and the, the answer is yes. But, because um, there's always a but, right? Um, right now, I mean, when we're committing 60 or 65 million to a new middle school, um, when you're working in a SPLOS that gives you about, about 200 million to be able to build in five years, um, knowing that there's pressing needs across the district and knowing that we have existing facilities that can absorb and we can get the programs and the right alignment that spending 65, 65 million on a middle school when we have an opportunity to make this move without the 65 million, those 65 million can go into improving so many more buildings. It's a matter of prioritization. So the answer is yeah, you could build a new one there, there's no question. But at the tune of that kind of money, that, that 65 million is likely better spent on reinvestment into existing buildings that are gonna have enough students and align with the portfolio of buildings we want. And so, look, I think that what I want to keep iterating is that the, the change of how we do this now is that we have a five-year plan that you're going to see that's going to turn into a 10-year plan. And the 10-year plan is a vision. And so, what, but what's nice about having a five and 10-year plan is that you have the ability to pivot. You have the ability to say, whoa, we got to get off the exit ramp here, to that gentleman's point, we have this influx of enrollment. What are we going to do to pivot to make sure that we have the right seats in the right place? And you can't do that on a yearly planning process. So that's a change in thinking. And so we want to make sure that, look, if there's a replacement of a building like that in time, yeah. We're the, you'll see in the plan, for those of you who read all the way to the bottom, is that the district is even seeking a partnership with the fort to acquire a new site at the fort. On the, on, the, on the edge of the fort that someday could become a new high school site. But that's a 10 to 15 year plan to do that. A new high school today would cost you $160, 70000000 million. And so it takes time to plan for that, but you want to be prepared for it. And so if you can get a piece of property now, take it. Bank it for a while, and if you need the property in time, how do you make the district on that west side reshape with population growth? Because it'll happen. The Ford will grow, that, all that stuff will grow. So we want to make sure that we're planning for that kind of stuff. I know that was a long answer to that, but I want to be sure that everybody knows planning is now going to be, it's a standard operations procedure. Community engagement all the way through the year is going to be standard in facilities planning. And we're always going to be looking next year, but we're always going to be looking five and ten years down the road so we can make those pivots and adjustments. And a second question from Joe Kimball. Do you have any idea if there will, if there will be a 10-year plan that may, be, that may affect this current five-year plan? <laughs> That's, well, I almost answered that. But, I mean, the idea is that, yeah, a 10-year plan, and this is what I always say, a f the five-year plan is tactical. You know that if you pass the SPLOST, that you have the dollars in your facilities to realign your facilities and reinvest in your facilities. So that's very tactical. Year six to 10 is visionary, is how does that five years impact the 10 years? And what we do in the five year can't impact the 10 year. And so I don't wanna do something that I know in 10 years, and that's always hard to predict, but that's kind of, the, that's kind of the, what we call the art of planning is that with the good data trends that we have, which the building trends we have, the program trends that we have, and keeping track of that every year and making sure that it aligns to both of those is important. Because those days of making sure that you took a school down here, now you need a new school. That, that's just, we, we just can't do that. Right now, 
because you do this annually, you're at risk of doing that. Done with those days. And so the answer is we're working toward that goal. And so, and we will get there. You can go ahead, ma'am. My name is Courtney. My question is what will happen to the teachers at Tech? The teachers stay together. That's the goal. The teachers stay together. And that's, again, it is a teacher decision on whether they want to move forward for sure and, and what they do because you almost had a retirement that we don't want, right? Um, but the, the goal is to work with human resources. And again, uh, here's what I'm going to ask you to do is that human resources is here to talk to you about that. Their goal is to not only come to you as a collective group, but talk to you individually if you want a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them to make sure that we want the staffs to stay together. We want more student cohorts to stay together. We don't want to split because it's about continuity and less disruption. So if the teachers want to stay in that position, that's what their goal, that's what their goal is, to make sure that happens. Okay? Thank you. And ma'am, if you'll leave your card. Oh, perfect. And, and real quick, anybody that now has a card that has not spoken at one of the previous uh, meetings and would like to come ask a question can make their way up. After we get through this batch, we'll get to anybody that has been to the meetings before and wants to ask another question. Yep. Um, my name is Angela Lewis. I'm a parent. Come a little closer to okay. me. My name is Angela Lewis, and Hi, I'm Angela. a parent. I want to know how does this affect kids with special needs, um, learning mm -hmm. disabilities, those who get assistance. The classrooms are getting bigger. How does that affect them? My baby gets has a... Um, IEP. Yep. Some other kids, other children have 504s. How sure. does that affect them with getting assistance? Yep. Um, bullying, things of that mm -hmm. nature. Yeah. Since it is, will be a larger facility. Mm -hmm. Will there be metal detectors? Metal mm -hmm. detectors for the kids to walk through. Yep. How does that affect security? Yep. I guess that is the question that I have. I want to know it. Please do not bamboozle me like you just did others. I want my my question answered directly. Uh, and I'm. First of all, I don't, I'm trying to answer these as honest as I can. The fact of the matter is, is that it is already difficult to offer special needs services across the district because you're spread thin. You probably experience that. Mm -hmm. So the commitment is, is to make sure there's enough. So first of all, special needs classes are mandated by size. That, that has to happen. And we figured in the capacity number for that special ed population. Okay, we haven't, we haven't figured every classroom at 25 or 30. We, fin we, cert we do it on a, on a scale that says if you have a capacity at 700, this is how many special ed classrooms you need. So that's how our capacity is figured for that. Now, I can't answer the staffing on it, and I apologize for that. But I got a, res I got a human resources team back there that can answer staffing on that. I can't answer that. I'm not an operations okay. guy. I'm a facilities guy. What I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a facility that has a space for it. That's what I can tell you. I can't tell you how it's going to be staffed. They can tell you that, OK? I promise you that. And Tracy, this, you can make your way. I'm going to read this question, but you can make your way. This is from uh, Michelle Roos. Um, if the board votes against the recommendation, what are, what are other options they have available to them to consider? Uh, what are the next steps? OK. It, I'm thinking it's in, in specific to this recommendation. Okay, in specifically to this recommendation, if this recommendation doesn't go forward, what will happen is that, that the Langford students will stay on the Langford campus and it's going to be another year before the middle school gets completed. And the reason for that, they'll have to phase the project because they have to keep students on the campus. So you have to keep a building while you're building a building and then you have to demolish part of the building while you're finishing the building. And so plan B, and there's two, and, and let me make sure I'm clear on this. The first thing is, is that the, the completion of this building is dependent on, us, on the passing of the SPLOST. And so making sure that the, SPLOST, the next SPLOST passes is important. Um, but if, if that happens, the backup plan is, is you have to wait another year for your school. And so that's the plan B. Um, it's already under design. The first part of this is funded. The back part needs an X-Blast to get funded. And so that's going to be plan B for this, this particular recommendation. Yes, please. 
Hi. Um, my name is Monica Tatella. I Before I go, I would just really like to say I am not here as a top parent. Okay. But I would really like to thank all of you for allowing us to have this space to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say seeing all of you today was really inspiring and moving. You can tell there is a community here, and I personally feel for you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little emotional about it inside my school. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what I wanted to bring up was I'm representing a few different parents from the TCM and the A.R. Johnson School okay. because there were some logistics that we noticed in your slides that numbers and things were not adding up for us. Okay. And we That's would fair. like to have the board know this now mm -hmm. so when our time comes to have the full meetings like this yeah. on when you vote for us, all of this has been taken into consideration already. So you had on your first slide that TCM has a population of 285 kids. Mm -hmm. I called them this morning. Their current population is 487. Next year, they will have 500 students. You can, you yeah, can wanna, shake I, your I, head. Yeah, I want to see that because I just want to, yeah. You I, can shake I your check. head and tell but I called them this morning. Okay. I want to check, check our numbers too. Yeah. yeah. That school can only hold 780 mm -hmm. kids at max capacity. I called A.R. Johnson and they let me know that their current population at their school is 655 students. They did not provide me with next year's probable enrollment, mm -hmm. but just by doing that math alone with at bare minimum 500, because there may be more, that would put 1,155 children in a building that is only able to hold 780 kids. So, and that doesn't include staff. Wait, so where do you get the 780 school? number? It's on, it, it is literally, in the office on a building said max capacity kids is 780. Oh. Yeah, that's uh, that's probably not how we calculate capacity. Well, I called them. That's you know. what that's yeah, what they okay. told me. Yeah, okay. You can calculate yeah, we'll, all we'll one, but that's it. the official number we, that is in the building that yeah, says this school can hold. It says on a wall, but I, I'll we'll, we'll the check. The school it. told me. We'll check you for it. The school we'll, told we'll, me. We'll check. We'll check it. I promise you, we'll check. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, that's the first thing I'd like to have them. That's 375 children over the capacity for that school. And even if it's not, that is a lot of children in one building where every single classroom is currently being utilized. There is not an empty classroom. And you can tell me it's not. I am a substitute teacher and I spent two months in a long-term position in that school. Every classroom so, is currently being utilized. So let me ask this question for you just really quick. So you're telling me there's how many kids at RCTC? There's 487 currently. And what did you say the capacity was? 780. So but every, they're still using every, 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 every yeah, they're using use. every classroom. Okay. okay. I mean, would I, you like to come? Well, I, no, I mean. You know what? I can make would, a video where I go that would tell me That would tell me the capacity is only 400 some. I mean, that does, utilizing every classroom doesn't okay. mean. I know. That they're that not That means we need to utilize their space better. I mean, there's, there's choir rooms. Yeah. Where are you going to put these kids? We're, we're gonna. We figured all that, so we'll. we'll okay. We're, yeah. The next item I'd like to address is these two schools are on completely different schedules. Mm -hmm. Our CTCM runs on what is known as block scheduling. Twenty percent of their population attends dual enrollment at the technical school. They go to an A B C schedule. They have four classes a day that are an hour and forty five minutes a day. They go to one, three five and seven on Mondays and Wednesdays, and then the other classes, and then a full seven classes on a Friday. A.R. Johnson does not function on that same schedule. How are we going to share a building with two schools, with schools that are on complete, I, I don't expect you to answer this, it's okay. like I said. Yeah. I'm just wanting this here for consideration. Okay. Yep. How are we, because that's not your job, like yep. you said. Okay. Yep. Um, like how are we gonna make that work? We can't just split a building in half and say this half works on this. Like, we're going to put in different PA systems. It, it, it's not going to mesh well. Um, the next thing I wanted to bring up was travel times for the A.R. Johnson children. Um, Augusta, the technical school does not offer medical classes. If you would like to take a medical class, you have to head to the Somerville campus. I also called them this morning and they confirmed that for me. So if they wanted to take a, keep the medical school going, they would have to take a 20-minute bus ride either to the VA or the medical district and a 20-minute bus ride back. That's 40 minutes worth of travel time all the way around 
When do they go to school? So just so you know, you know that's not daily. I, I actually put it, I, I do okay. that drive, sir. Yeah, I know. No, no, no. The, the drive time, yeah, I know that. But the way, the way that works is that it's, just, it's not a daily into the clinicals. No, so, so but there that, is that. We're working with the logistics of that and how you make that work better. But like, so we want to do both. We yeah. want to make sure that we're pushing some of the professionals into the school so no more kids get access well, to it. I mean, my mother-in-law is a teacher. She's a nursing yeah. school teacher, mm -hmm. and she would tell you that that is an incredibly ineffective way to teach nursing, like medical school students. That they need to be in the, as much as they can. They need, first of all, they need their, their lab. They need that. Yeah, and there's that. no space, for, unless you put them in the garage, there's really not space for that at TCM. I'm just going to let okay. you know. You okay. put them in the garage? Okay. <laughs> um, the answer to that is no, by the way. Yeah. So there's no, medical, there's no medical classes available for students at Tech. So if they tell you that, you would have to go out to Somerville to go to those classes. Um, and the other thing is, my concern, my biggest concern is, there are a lot of requirements for schools to keep themselves magnet schools certified. Has anyone looked into if by combining these schools and not properly having these specialized curriculums involved in the community, could we possibly lose magnet school status on one, if not both schools? Like, it's feeling like at this point, someone is gonna have to give up programs, which is something we're actually trying not to do, combining these schools together, you know? So, has anyone looked into that? So, magnet school certification, and I would refer to teaching and learning Yeah, I know, like too. I said, yeah, that's what I this is for consideration. Yeah, so, um, I, and you know, the goal isn't the long term for that, right? That the goal isn't that they're combined programs for eternity. Well, I know. Right? Okay. Um, just so I you mean, just, you see, I just want to make sure that you know that. Yeah, too. but okay. we also don't want to lose our school. Absolutely. And we really don't want to go to Josie either. Yeah. And also something that I would like to put out there that really doesn't, it's again, not for Sorry you. Yeah. I would like to consider maybe possibly keeping all of the magnet schools available. We do not currently have any type of program in this, in a, a, a really good one, in this county that is vocational. We just heard women talking about their kids who are electricians. Why can't we have a school that does that, that carpentry? We have so much construction happening in this town. Why do, like where I'm from, by the way, boiler up. <laughs> I knew I liked her. <laughs> where I'm from, um, our, our, one of our best schools, it's called Valparaiso High School, has a vocational program where children go out and they work with construction crews and when they graduate, they're able to go straight into the construction field and work. Carpentry, I just paid somebody eight grand to replace my air conditioner. Why, why do we not have stuff like that? And I really do, I, wa I wanna see Josie get that building. But I think it would be amazing for our community if we had a school that provided cyber, if we had a school that provided tech jobs, a school that provided art, a school that provided health and sciences, and a school that provided vocation. I really think that's something that the board should consider for that building because it would be phenomenal to feed these amazing children into our community. I love that, thank you. Um, and let me, let me tell you this on the career, and this is what I can tell you, that the district just got completed with the Carl Vinson Institute a study on career and technical education for Richmond County. And so, um, got prepared, they're just on the, on the cusp of releasing what the long-term, what the big district vision is for that, to include exactly the programs you just talked about, to think about that, and how to deliver it at a high school and a centralized location both, so local students can have access to programs that don't want to leave their high schools, or have a choice to go to a, a career school. And so one of the visions for Josie was that. How do you get that I mean, in there too? it would be too? fantastic. Yeah, and we, we agree. And so, yeah. so in the next couple of months, based on that Carl Vinson um, report that they came and worked with Richmond County on, and working with curriculum and, and instruction to release now a, long, a, a bigger vision and how that will work in Richmond County. So we're on the cusp of it. That's and, just all I'm asking them to consider. And I, yeah, I I'm hoping it does. Because I think having four phenomenal yeah 
programs yeah. out there is the best thing for our I, community I agree. as a whole. And we want to keep the magnet strong. They're important to a district. Okay. Thank so, you. Thank that, you. That was all I had. Thank you for that. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, I was born in Valparaiso, Indiana, so we got a little connection there, too. Oh, yeah, there we go. I love it. So. Um, and at this point, what we'll do is uh, we've, we've called for the folks from Tut and Langford, for anybody from the other schools. If you have already spoken at a meeting and you would like to now make your question as we start gearing towards the last portion of the Q&A, you can start making your way up here. Um, go ahead, ma'am. My name is Charity Santiago, and I have grown up in Richmond County my whole life. I live here. My children have gone to Richmond County schools, a graduate from Westside, one from Davidson, and a son of A.R. Johnson. I am also a, an employee at an elementary school at Warren Road. <clears throat> one of my questions pertains to all of the schools that are having to combine. Right now, we have so many behavior issues at every school, single school at every single level of education in our county, probably in many other counties as well, but how are, you, how are we planning to keep teachers, students, and staff safe at the schools? Because it's already an issue right now. So, and at Warren yeah. Road specifically, yeah. we're talking about adding, we have 592 um, students right now, at least that's what the paper says. Um, and we're talking about getting around 90 more students. I can tell you that every classroom is being utilized. We have in our two special education rooms, we have one teacher with three paras in that room. We have another special education room with four teachers in it. We have a special education teacher in fifth grade who is in a classroom with another teacher. Um, we have staff that have converted closets for their offices. We don't have any room. And yeah. right now the behaviors are so awful, I can't even imagine bringing that many more students in. Okay, so um, as, look, and, and the, the behavior thing is I think is an important topic, and there's no question it is. And so I think you know, one of the things that we've talked about in these combination things is how the district supports those schools when that happens. Now again, I can't answer that operational question for you. What I do know is that we've talked about it from an operational standpoint is how do you get the support in the schools to try to minimize it. So where do we put these 90 so children? So the other though? piece of that, and I was going to get to that in just a minute. So I, that, so I, help, I can't answer that to my best. I can, I can tell you we've talked about it from an operational standpoint in this discussion. Hopefully the district can provide that support for, more, uh, for that discipline stuff. And again, we're trying to spend dollars where we don't have them already, and we're trying to figure that out. So that's one step. The second one is, is that right now, um, right now that Benton and his team are going out to your buildings to visit to see where we need to make those adjustments to the new enrollments coming in. Okay, and so they're going to review your school. We're going to go back and review the school also. Remember, we know there's declining enrollment coming in, and so we're not going to have that we're still not going to feel that pressure. It's going to actually minimize, especially in that corridor. It's still talking about 670 yeah. students being at Warren yeah. Road next year. Yeah. And right now, right now all the classrooms are full of students. Okay. And every like space, like even in the library, all the, all the rooms in the libraries have, in the library has people, teachers okay. doing things. Okay. We'll, we're going to go, we'll go talk to, we're going to be out the building, okay, and we're going to go look at that, okay? So again, that's why we're here to talk to you, so we hear those kind of things from you who are in there. So I appreciate you bringing that to us. We'll be out there. Yeah, because I don't, out. and you said you're going to yeah. combine teachers in these schools. I, there wouldn't even be a place to house another teacher. Well, there'll be, I mean, there are, in that case where the Warren Road's getting that, kind of Mary's getting kind of split a little bit, it's going to be a little different than being able to take whole student population, or whole teacher populations with that, and that's something that that Mary's going to have to deal with, unfortunately, is some split in that. So again, that's something we want to come out and see your school and look at that to make sure we're okay on that. That's why we're here to listen to see the day-to-day -day stuff too. Benton has his team going out to look at all those things also, and we'll be looking at those things that you just talked about to right. see where we have opportunity. And then uh, another question, again, the A.R. Johnson, you know, mm -hmm. my son is at A.R. Johnson. So as a parent, I graduated from A.R. Johnson. Right. As a parent, I am concerned about him going out to TCM as well. That's yeah. 
combining so many children. He is on the medical track, mm -hmm. and it makes absolutely no sense for him to be out there when he's going to supposed to be going to the different clinicals that are in downtown Augusta. So the, a couple things, and again, I, and I think that if and I'm going to say it again tomorrow night, and I'll say it again on Monday night. This is something we've talked about a lot in the last couple of meetings on A.R. Johnson, is that from a singular standpoint of an A.R. Johnson, if you're just taking that lens, that make, I mean, and it does make sense, and we've considered that. We've talked about that a lot internally and how, what, what we have to do to adjust to that. The other piece of that is that we have a district-wide issue. We've got a district-wide thing of how we get our high schools how, are, how we get our middle schools better prepared to have high school students enter in. And so the idea that we have an opportunity to make a middle school have an adjacency to a high school to share resources at a non-magnet school has to come into play. We can't ignore the Laney feeder pattern. We can't ignore the Josie feeder pattern just because one other school has that. And so we've considered there's a lot of things to consider outside just the singular school perspective. A.R. Johnson's important. It is a, it is a, it is a well, product of a great district. Part of the way district. the school was built was considering that it has the medical portion. So sure. classrooms were actually built in that school when it mm -hmm. was completely raised and rebuilt mm -hmm. as A.R. Johnson not mm -hmm. that many years ago to, house, to have laboratories for yep. the medical students. Yep. And even the engineering okay. students, they yep. have specific things for them as right. well. Okay. Yeah, and we know that. We absolutely know that. It's a great middle school building too. Turning labs into science and doing all that for middle grades is a great opportunity too. It's a great opportunity to have a joined campus for middle schools and high schools in a non-magnet feeder to be able to get those resources that they need both ways. So there's a lot to consider from a district perspective and a school by school perspective. What, we, what we've come to tell you is this, is that our logic behind our thinking there, that it wasn't just we don't just singularly look at schools and say we're going to make a decision on one building. There's, there's 28,000 students to consider here. And so that is part of the thinking. And what we want to do is just tell you how we got to that conclusion. Now, the other thing is, is that we didn't do it next year. And I want, to, I want to make that clear. We didn't do it next year for the very reason that you guys just talked about, is that we need time to look at that. We need the time to look at that curriculum. We need to take time to see how the, how the career tech program and how the magnet, the medical magnet, and how other medical pathways that will exist in the district from a perspective of getting into more local schools so they can feed into other things, we want to make sure there's more access. And so there's, some, there's a lot of things to consider from a curriculum standpoint, and that's the reason it's not next year. And right. so we got time to think about that. And one of the reasons, from what I understand, that the magnet schools were put downtown mm -hmm was because they're magnet schools and was to keep them downtown because of the the atmosphere just to bring um, other students in from all different areas yeah i mean the, yeah the intent of magnets uh, in historically has been to try to keep what we call a donut hole from impacting it that means the district grows out this way and so Again, one of the things about thinking about, and, I, and again, I, th I think district-wide, I think about the investment of Josie, because I'm going to tell you, and you all know this, is that when I first walked in this district, I bet I had 100 people tell me, you're closing Laney and Josie, we already know it. And I'm like, I don't know how you know that, because I don't even know that. And so, but the thought is, is that if you start to do that and start to look at even at the high school, and you start to get the core of the city and you shut down schools in the core of the city, the only thing it can do is spread out. And so trying to invest in the core for the neighborhoods to reinvest to is an important thing for this district to keep the core alive. The magnet intended, the magnet was created for a lot of reasons, including you know, desegregation of schools to keep schools open. It's trying to get you know, that to happen. And so there's a lot of history of why magnets exist. But the thing is, is that, and what you learn about good magnet programs, is good magnet programs survive, and they're very good at it. And so, and the intent, again, the intent is always to make sure that those magnets are supported. The goal was, is that eventually, because of the Josie, and look, I hear it, and, if, and I don't, and look, and I, and I do hear it, I don't want my kid going down to Josie. Well, wait till you see that state-of-the-art facility they're going to get. But I do think that... I think that we want to work to every school's success. 
when, when we matriculate this out, the AR Johnson program would have room to expand and to make a bolder program. And again, that was one of our thinking. How do you make the magnet bolder? How do you make it more accessible to students? Because we do want to promote the magnets, but not at the expense of our neighborhood schools. And so we want to do both together. So we're trying to balance the two. So I appreciate the concerns that you have, and we're hearing those concerns. Just this morning, we had another meeting on it. We got the internal staff together because of what we have been hearing to really talk about the benefits and challenges of it. So when we is the keep coming. For the, thank you. When is the meeting for, that you're going to have at AR Johnson? So we haven't scheduled yet, but I got to get through this next year's stuff by the 19th. And so we're going to look. It's going to be the spring still, okay, or as we go in. Thank you. So we do want to come out and talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, the final three questions were submitted um, for us to read out. <clears throat> the first question is uh, special education conducive classrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the plan for, uh, what, is it planned in this proposal? And particularly she was uh, wanting to know about space, mm -hmm. uh, restrooms inside of the classroom and just more conducive special education um, classrooms throughout the district. Okay, so um, let me ask really quick as a clarifying question. Are we talking about the new building? Uh, she's talking about overall buildings. Oh, overall. Overall. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a great question. So first of all, in the new buildings, the new buildings are designed to have specialized special ed space, not just a closet that we've moved because we have space to. So there are specific suites that have restrooms, showers, changing tables, specific for special needs students. That's how new schools are designed. Yet another reason we have to build new schools and renovate schools and reinvest, because we're not doing our special needs students right on that. So the new schools have those great spaces. Now, throughout the district, this is what I'm going to share with you. And, I'm, and I've shared this today because this is why we come out. Last night, um, at, no, the night before at Mary, we had a parent come out and said that they were the only reason they go to Mary right now they were, a road, well, she was a Warren Road family and loved Warren Road School. So thank you, Warren Road people who are ever here, right? She loves Warren Road, but Warren Road didn't have a special ed program for her student that could be served at her school. So she didn't have a choice. She had to move out of her home boundary to go to a, a welcoming Mary. She's happy at Mary, loves her teachers. But the fact of the matter is, is that because we don't have, because we're so spread thin in the special ed, especially in special ed, that she, that mom doesn't have a choice. She has to go to another school outside of her boundary to get the special ed. One of the, and I hate to say benefits of consolidation, but one of the benefits of consolidation is to get rid of that, is to make sure that every school has it. And so when we look at the receiving schools program, so when we go back to Warren Road or into Lake Forest Hills or go into Garrett Road, in that Mary situation, is to go into that, new, that special ed program that'll be there because it's fully funded. Now. I will also tell you that that's a really small rudder of change to make sure that we can get to where we need to get to so every school can, so every school can serve and you have the right spaces. I wish we had enough dollars to do them all right away. We don't yet. But look, the new, the new schools that are being built have those right accommodations. And the renovations of schools will have those accommodations with the capacities for special needs students. But the other thing we need to do is we need to get the enrollment to the enrollment that we need to make sure we have the programs there. So that's what I can tell you from a facility side. From an operations side, I will tell you it's getting tougher and tougher to recruit in the special needs. Um, we're seeing less teachers going into that too. There's, it's hard work and not enough pay and, and all that. The ones that we have, God bless them, we know it. Uh, every teacher too. but. We get that. So we're going to try to make sure the spaces are there so teachers want to come and teach in those spaces. That's what I can do from a facility side for you. In the new Langford, I'm excited because it does have it. It has space that is dedicated for special needs students. So we're getting there. It's one step or the other. I wish I had a better answer. I wish I had a better answer for you. All right. Uh, next question is Tamarin Borkins Robinson. How does the merger affect the sports program is the first question. Hmm. Well, I think, again, that's an operational question. The sports programs, um, well, what, I've, what I know about when the, the enrollments can get a little larger is that there can be more sports opportunities. I know that's one thing, is that, you know, we all know that there's only, you know, five players can be on a basketball court, only 11 players on the football field, and nine players on a baseball field. So we do know that. But 
what it can do is promote more participation in that. You know, a lot of middle schools in the city struggle because of their enrollment to, to house a football team that players don't have to play both ways for four quarters. Because they just don't have enough participation because they don't have enough students to participate. So it can offer more opportunities for students in athletics, we do know that. But what I get more excited about, it gives more opportunities in the fine arts also. That we can have band and choir and music teachers because those are just as important as athletics. And so I do think that the, the sports can get enhanced by this. Again, at the new site and the new facility, I can't wait to see until you see the practice fields and the competition fields there because they're built for those middle school kids and they're going to have the opportunities on those fields that right now is very difficult on the current sites that we have. How does the merger affect classroom safety with neighborhood gang violence slash school rivalry issues? So, and, and, and again, I think that we, we've, we've asked the question and I know that, and I don't want to ignore the question again, but what I do want to say is that the internal discussion about how safety is approached has to be an ongoing discussion. The board has these concerns also, we know that. The internal staff has this. And so making sure that we're doing right by making sure we have, I heard the metal detectors earlier, I didn't answer that question and I apologize for that. But making sure that we have equipment that works when it comes to those kind of things. But also making sure that if there's an investment in staff for security and that staff is available, I mean, like you said, it's getting harder to find. But the commitment is, if that's what staff that's needed to make the merger work, Keep having the conversation as you go into the resource and the human resource conversation, but as even the district works with you as a staff here and the administration, keep pushing to make sure that that is a top priority. Again, I can't help you on an operational side on that. But what I can tell you, the discussions are happening. They, they truly are. I'm not bamboos. I'm not lying to you. Those are top concerns. And so we want to make sure we're staffing for it. Deandra Dabuski. I hear proposed plan, but yet we're moving forward. What's the purpose of the board voting if this is technically official? Well, first of all, it's not official. You look at these board members, and I think, as I ask the board members, they learn something every night when they hear these comments. And I look, and I know the notes are there. They're going to get the transcripts. I do think there's going to be questions about are there some adjustments we can make for next year. Now, this one in particular, I'm going to tell you that this school is in full design. The brand new school is in full design right now. That if the board decides they don't want to do it, and they can still make that decision based on these things that they've heard tonight around safety concerns, around staffing, all that kind of stuff, and around capacity, the, 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 it's not the consequence. The, the B plan for that is just you'll just wait another year. And then at the end of that, you'll just combine the schools into that new state of the art building. And so there are adjustments. And I'm going to tell you, all the things that we have heard. If you've watched my presentation, some of you have from the beginning, you've noticed I've altered some to adjust to some of these comments that we do. Because it is evolving, it's living, and we want to make sure it continues to do that. And so I can tell you that the, the plan is a solid plan, but if we do have too much concern about the early combination, then the board will raise that concern, and it'll be their decision to do it. And that's why this isn't final. The board still has a say on this. And they're hearing you. They're here listening to you. Um, quick question yeah. about Langford. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was there a traffic study conducted? Has traffic been taken mm -hmm. into account in the patterns for that area and that new site? So here, here's what I'm going to say because I wasn't here for the early design of that building. But typically, what happens in an architectural design kind of to get the site, they typically have to do traffic studies because they have to get the, the traffic lights, the turn lanes, all that stuff, and they have to adjust that. I'm going to. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to refer you back to transportation and to the back two because I want them to answer the question. That's exactly right. So part of that will be the nice part, again, about a new facility is that you can build bigger queue lines to get people on the site and to queue them. Because what time do parents show up to pick up kids? About 45 minutes before that school ends and it starts to back up on the streets. Yeah, yeah, no secret there. Part of that design is to make sure that there's enough queue space that you can get people off the road. And Frankly, it's a, it's a design requirement. Code requires that. Um, traffic studies require that. I can't tell you the specific study, so I'll have to refer you back to them, but I can tell you that's very typical before you start design to do that in the process. And so I want to, and there's, there's facilities guys that have begin the be, at the beginning of this that are back there, they can help with that question too. 
Yeah, thank you. It's a great question, the, too. The next question is from Ms. Janice Ramirez, mm -hmm. and this is more of an operational question. All right. Yeah. Um, can we ensure that programs like iReady are shelved and done away with so that students have more access to human instructions? Our kids go to, uh, our kids go to physical classes only to have a virtual experience. When can we have a conversation about ineffective programs? So, and, and, and I love that Janice comes back and keeps us on the record because I do think there should always be continuous review of that. The two biggest impacts on education and I will tell you this, people want to talk about it all the time. I've been doing this 25 years. I've done enough research for a lifetime in this. The two biggest impacts on education and educational attainment are socioeconomics and direct instruction in the classroom. It ain't a computer. It ain't a phone. Technology can support it. But I need a good teacher in front of a kid teaching. Those are the two proven facts of student education success. We can talk about race all day long. We can talk about class size all day long. We can talk about school size all day long. But I can show you the biggest schools in the country that are top performing schools, and I can show you small schools that are top performing schools. I can show you all white schools that have so bad socioeconomic issues that they're not succeeding either because they're moving in front of the rent as much as I can show you other races too. So, what I want to tell you, pay attention to socioeconomics and keep teachers strong in the classroom because those will have more impact than anything we ever do. We work together as a community as one family. Regardless of our background, our race, or ethnicity, I can see it here at Tut. You work as a family together. You work through all those things that society has pushed on you, but make sure we get the teachers in front of the kids and we get that socioeconomic so we get kids out of that poverty and get kids into where we can get moved forward. And, that, and I can't solve that in facilities. I can help get the, those in order for you, though. So thanks. Keep bringing that question, guys. Keep bringing the question, because I love the question. So that will bring our meeting to a conclusion. We've uh, answered every question that was submitted. As you can see in the back, you'll have human resources, teaching and learning, special education and transportation. Tracy will stay over here if you have any additional questions. If you can join us uh, tomorrow or that, uh, the remaining meetings, just to be clear, March 12th, that will be the last public hearing. And on March 19th, the board will be voting only on the 24-25 plan. The rest of the plan will be received as information. Have a Thank good evening. Thank you. Be careful. Thank you.